Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 297. Wow. Pretty crazy. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my son, Chris Reagan. Chris, good to see you. Pick up that acoustic guitar and play us a little ditty. That makes us feel something. <laughs> certainly not. No, <laughs> certainly never. Play us a little ditty. A little uh, play us like Wonderwall or something. Yeah. Dude, you know? I, I hated playing guitar because we would be like, play Wonderwall. <laughs> Wonderwall. <laughs> I don't like. I, I, honestly, I don't even think I've ever sat down and listened to Oasis willingly interesting actually like i don't think i know any other oasis songs at all actually you would probably know champagne supernova oh yeah okay don't yeah, look I've... back in anger you'd probably know i know that name i know the yeah. name don't look back in anger i, I don't, don't know look I back in anger i've never heard it actually <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound even really familiar to me no i didn't do a very good job of it either that oasis record what's the story morning glory that was like everywhere when i was in middle school everyone fucking loved that record and yeah champagne supernova is a pretty dope song sad but wonderwall i can they really overplayed it the the great thing is you probably actually know this chris is that oh the brothers and oasis fucking hate each other and that's the coolest part about it is that they hate each other yeah they've gotten into like fights on stage and like crazy shit and that's the funniest part liam and no 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Noel. Um, Noel or something. Uh, the, yeah, the, um, they, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's the that's the curse of having when you when you bring Wonderwall into into the world. That's what you're cursed with in response. Right. By the universe is, is a relationship with your brother that you cannot. The, 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 the person closest to you is the person you hate the most. You're my Wonderwall. Uh, uh, and you have to say wall like wow. Wow. wow, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin Furman, executive oh. producer, wearing his Akira shirt. Akira! Akira. Good to, see you. good to see you today. Leave me alone, dude. So good. I'm glad that became a meme recently. And if anyone hasn't watched Akira, it's top tier. 10 out of 10. If you love animation even the slightest, you got to watch it. But I'm doing all right today. I feel slightly... So I, you may notice my hair... I realized in the last few days it's too long to style anymore, so I desperately need a haircut. You look like a little boy. Yeah, it's a little little boy vibes, and that's okay. But you know, getting a haircut is a whole to do. I will do it. But Chris, you you know, Colin asked you to play something, and you immediately said no. And it reminds me, there's often like two types of guitar people. There's the people that make it fully their identity. They're like sitting out by the lockers playing, hoping that some girl notices them. And then there's the people that are almost like you don't even know they play guitar, but they're actually awesome at it in secret. Mm -hmm. Usually and usually the secret guitar players are the best and the public ones are not very good. Not always. Not always. Not in my case. Not in my case. I think I don't think I'm a particularly amazing guitarist, but like I do think like I don't know. I, I, I was the only person in my close group of friends who played guitar and we grew up in like the the up like upstate new york so we would have these bonfires and be like bring your guitar dude i'd be like i really don't want to i i I do this by myself Mm -hmm. in like Mm -hmm. almost on purpose uh and and so i would do it they would like bully me into doing it basically and it was horrible like it was it was fine looking back on it but in the moment it was just like oh my god i don't want i don't want this to be the perception because i don't want this there's only one thing worse than the notorious guitar guy it's one step further it is the the ukulele guy don't get me wrong ukulele a fine instrument uh, i love hearing it on songs but it's overrated you know when you see the guy running around with the ukulele walk immediately in the other direction as yeah. far as, as fast as you can really oh it's a ukulele i wonder what kind of oh hawaiian music <laughs> wow we're gonna fucking unique. luau um I've known both kinds of guitar players. Ramon is the best guitar player I've ever, who does our music is uh, the best guitar player I've ever known by far. Just an absolute natural. And, and in college, he was a little bit more like I remember going to a party specifically with him and him getting really upset that there was a guy playing guitar and how bad he was. Ended up getting into like some argument with this dude about it. He's not like that anymore. I don't play. An, I mean, I play guitar and bass like 
okay, but I'm a drummer, as everyone knows, and that's not an instrument you just break out. No, you, know, you don't just you gotta, work. You got to get the hand drum, the djembe. <sighs> the djembe, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, play you that just on campus. You just don't break out the drums. You just don't. Everyone in the neighborhood knows you play. Yeah, you have to sure. do it at like certain times. Now is not the time. But I'm a pretty good rock drummer, I think. You know, I don't play any of the crazy nonsense that's out there. I was making how fun often, of double, ba- double bass pedal. The other how, often do the you, other uh, how often do you play? Will you play like every day? Yeah, pretty much every day. That's yeah. Yeah, that's that's more than I do guitar. Like so I I go through periods where I play guitar every day for like like sometimes for like a a couple hours, and then I go through periods of months where I don't I don't touch it at all. And I like have that's, a that's, that's been my experience. I have a set, I think I've said this before. I have a set list on my. This is actually kind of a bummer because I wish I could. So on Spotify, I have this playlist and I just add drum songs to it, songs that I want to play drums to, and. Because I play them so much, these songs, they end up at the top of my Spotify yearly playlist. And I'm like, damn, I wish I could isolate this playlist and say, like, don't count this playlist because my most played songs are definitely not these songs. It's just that I'm playing them over and over again on drums. But let's see. I have quite a few songs on here. Let's see if there's any on here that you would like that you would know. A lot of Breaking Benjamin's first record on Mm. this list. That album sat that album. I fucking love that record. Saturate. Yeah, it's so good. Oh, my God, dude. That that album came out when I was a senior in high school and I like and it was uh, polyamorous was the first the first like song. That's the uh, the single. Oh, I love that. I play a lot of Foo Fighters, especially the first three records or so. A lot of Alice in Chains. Mm-hmm. I like playing mm-hmm. them. I have My Chemical Romance's Helena on this list. I added recently uh, all the small things by Blink-182 added that recently. That's got a cool one with cool like feels. Doom, doom, da, ba, doom, doom, da. You know the work sucks. Hit, hit me with that. Hit me with that. That harmony, Chris. Ready? Absolutely. Work sucks. I can't. Do it. I hate. I. I. We. I think we've actually. <laughs> I think we've actually talked about this before on the show. But like Blink One Eighty Two was that was that weird. It's that's that weird band for me where it's like I I liked everything adjacent to it to the point where it's weird that I don't like it. Dude, I, I'm I in never, the same boat. Chris, I, I, yeah, I also am not really a Blink fan. I don't hate them, but yeah, it's it's like I, I I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Like I couldn't, I couldn't Hello do it. Hello there. Yeah, I'm like, so sorry. I no, couldn't uh, do it. It just I used to make fun of that too. I always wished it was just the other dude singing. Right. Or, Why can't he just sing, Mark Hoppus? Yeah. Yeah. It, he has it, like a just, great voice. Like you hear that in a lot of the songs where it's like, oh yeah. And then the other guy comes in and it's like, damn, dude, it was kind of like the dude, I'll honestly, in a little, not as bad, but in System of a Down, when they, he started to kind of sing, the guitarist, mm. you know, why yeah. does everybody send the poor? All right. What else on here? Oh, a lot of Offspring. That makes sense. You know, what's a really fun song to play on drums? Dr. Feelgood by Motley Crue. I play that all the time. That's on mm-hmm. there. There's a lot of stuff. Stone Temple Pilots. Pretty much every Rage Against the Machine song. A great song to play on on drums is Backstreet Boys' "Larger Than Life." Really cool. Hell yeah, on that song. <laughs> oh yeah, Good tons shit. of Smashing Pumpkins. I don't play very much 311. 311 is very complicated on the drums, um, but there are a few songs on here. And then one Mike gets tired of hearing it because I play it all the time is No Doubt's "Tragic Kingdom." That whole record. That was like maybe one of the most inspirational records for me to become a drummer when I was a kid. I was ten years old when that album came out. And so I play that all the time. But yeah, I'm always on there. The problem, I got to get the inner ear stuff and I want to get the app. I watch the YouTube channel all the time. There's a really awesome YouTube channel called Drumeo. Do you, I don't know if you ever heard of it. D-R-U-M-E-O. And it's super awesome. Like they do all sorts of stuff. But one of the cool things they do is they invite professional drummers in, show them drumless songs that they've never heard before and then see if they can figure it out, like what it would actually heard, sound like. Oh, I saw the Megadeth drummer do that for Mr. Brightside. Right, right. I was like, I think I've heard of this channel. And uh, so they have an app where apparently they have tens of thousands of drumless songs. And I really just need to go to that because that would be so fun. That's really cool. That's an awesome idea. I wish I wish that I was more in tune with drums in general, because like as you were going through all those songs, I was like, oh, yeah, I know those songs. But then I was thinking about it like, I don't know. I don't think I don't know the drum patterns to any of those, even though like I know those songs really intuitively. And it's like it's just like this weird blind spot for me, even when I'm like recording stuff like I don't. I have like a hard time figuring out. I was like, how do I add drums to this? I have no idea. So I won't. <laughs> and I'll give it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah. you, put, you put drums in this because I can't. I have no fucking clue where to begin with that. I told, I told you guys, right, that I found VHSs of my old band. 
Oh, no, I have oh, to nice. get those digitized at some point. Like our, our, we have like whole videos of our li- the live shows we would play. This was in like 2003, mm-hmm. 2004. Actually, the ride symbol, I have my, um, I gave my first drum kit to my nephews. And it was like, you know, this kid I got in middle school and they got rid of it finally this many years later. And so they actually dropped a bunch of my old symbols off. And I was like so stoked. This is my ride symbol from, from um, high my school. My dad had that exact one. Color ride? Red. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I got to, I don't know. I want to, God, I love ride symbols and, and the, the different tones you get out of them. Symbols themselves are just so fun. And I was saying on the show the other week that, you know, I was a kid. I was getting like secondhand symbols. And my first hi-hat was, was uh, on a hi-hat stand, but it was two field symbols on a hi-hat stand. Mm-hmm. And you didn't really even know the difference, but they were very heavy, obviously. So it's like so cool. Symbols are, my symbols are more expensive than my drum kit. Like it behind me, like the symbols cost more. Um, and it's cool to have like a little bit of money as an adult where it's like, oh, I can actually get nice things for once, you know, um, as opposed to like secondhand nonsense. So God, I love playing the drums, but it's a lot of upkeep. It's not for everyone. I was complaining about that on Summon Sign recently, how it's just a lot. That's why I minimized to a jungle kit because I'm like, I can't, I can't be dealing with all this anymore. Things are falling out of tune. You got to get yeah. new heads. I feel like it's a really 7,000 symbols. I had roto toms at one point. I'm like, I don't even know what to do with these. I think it's straight up. I have no idea where to even implement these in anything I play. Why do I have these? You know, (laughs) anyway, I'm sorry. I'm going on a rant. Can I guess? Can I be honest with you guys for for a second? You might not be able to read it, but I'm feeling a little melancholy last week or so. I noticed. I noticed when we got on the call, you seemed a little down i don't know what it's all about when we started like it's i'm a generally sad person i'm not even saying that to be dramatic like or like funny i am just right. a sad person and a lot of my upbeat not that i'm always upbeat but like where i'm like hey how are you doing you know like i try to be talkative and nice and friendly a lot of that is a like is to try to make myself feel better and i think i got so i got sick last week really sick and i was out of commission for a while and then when i was starting to kind of come back to i just felt this real melancholic sadness i don't even know like why necessarily this real i don't know it's very it's probably for it's probably been several years since i felt this way hmm. yeah um i don't know what it's all about though really don't well you're going on a little trip and sometimes a change in environment so a shake up might shake you out might oh, not fuck. I just my, my leg on the fucking desk um yeah that also shook me out of it <laughs> But yeah, I am. We are going to Boston from the, the day this will go live. We're going. Um, we're going to go see the Bruins on Saturday and just hang out. We won't even be there for two days. We'll be back on Sunday afternoon. But yeah, I'm, I am looking forward to it. I haven't been to Boston. since. I was thinking about it. Like, when was the last time I was in Boston? I think it was 2016. Uh, I was there for PAX. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah, I don't think. And I lived there, obviously, for five years. So we'll be uh, going around, going to Northeastern. I want to go to the. My favorite part of going going to the old school is going to the store. Again, another place where when you were a kid and you were or like a teenager when you went there and it's like, I can't afford any of this stuff. And now you go in <laughs> and they ask you like what year you graduated and stuff. And I'm like, oh, man, got to get that new. I got to get a new Northeastern jersey. This is this jersey is not the one they wear anymore. I look like a fucking loser with this jersey on, on my chair. I can't take it. But yeah, I'm sad. That's it. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm sad. Yeah, there's something I don't know. There's something in the air lately. I, I kind of I kind of felt that, too, although it's been rainy here in Los Angeles the last couple of days, which, by the way, I didn't sign up for this. Mm. Not what I. It's almost it almost defeats the purpose yeah. of being here in some way, because yeah, I, I remember that was, that was one of the most exciting things about moving here in the first place. When I first came here many, many years ago, it was like, oh, shit, it, it barely rains. This is great. I don't have to worry about any of that shit. And now it's like. It feels like I'm in fucking Seattle. Is it raining today? No, it looks like, well, there's clouds. I don't know. It's, it's overcast E. So like, I don't know. I don't know what the hell's going on. I wanted to get burned by the sun forever until I died at a, at a very young age. But right. prune. Alas, looks like I have a long hydrated life ahead of me. Oh, very hydrated Badly. indeed. Yeah, the rain. It's been raining. I mean, it's, the weather's weird here too. I, I was out walking with the dogs before we started recording because I was like, it's so nice out unusually nice out but it has been raining here a lot too maybe we're gonna be flooded again like the the days of noah oh go on the ark two by two isn't that what it was yeah is that what it was yeah something like that that makes sense 
But uh, Dustin, you can't come. Anyway. Ah. Okay. I'll hang out. I'm, I'm not a good coming. swimmer, though. But Oh, no? No. no I've never been a good... I can... Dude, for the longest time, I couldn't even tread water. I just sunk down. I can now. I figured it out <laughs> yeah, at some point. Like a rock, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I'm not a not afraid of swimming you know i'm i'm fine i'll jump in the deep end no problem but yeah water water's did you ever it's like uh there's a subreddit called thalassophobia it's like fear of like deep ocean oh Oh. well that makes sense yeah that's that's a i guess that's a little different so i guess i'd be fucked in this in this uh arc two in this diluvian isn't that what it would be anti isn't diluvian isn't that the word for (laughs) <laughs> Noah's, Noah's Ark isn't that uh, am I right about that an Diluvian? antediluvian maybe Dilu- like a Dilu- uh, an- what is the antediluvian age the bi- uh, yeah the antediluvian time. age is after oh, yeah. after Noah's Ark right yeah yeah yeah, we got to make sure we get this definition perfect. We yeah. don't want to start anything <laughs> of relating to or brought about by a flood. I don't know where the hell that came from. Oh, Dude, okay, so I, a flood. Yeah. I have to say, man, like I, I don't know, a phobia of the deep ocean. I'm. Phobias are defined as irrational fears, and Ooh. I feel like I feel like we have to start. We have to start having like we. There needs to be a word for a ra- whatever the opposite of fear, like an irrational unfear, like to jump into the deep ocean and be like, ah, yeah, it's whatever. I think that's irrational. Yeah, exactly. I think that's completely irrational. Like, you you are where you absolutely shouldn't be from like an evolutionary perspective. You should not be in the middle of the ocean. You are a, you are a monkey. No business being there. So intrinsically, that doesn't make sense that you're totally comfortable with that. Also, just a sea of complete unknown organisms and parasites and creatures underneath you, an infinite abyss. Like I have like I'm not the best swimmer, but I can swim in like a deep end pool, no problem. Like I don't give a shit. Just kick off the ground. But like if I'm thrown off a boat in the middle of the ocean, I'm probably going to get in my own head to be like, I can't swim here. I can't swim here. I'm gonna sink. Yeah. I would rather be in space than deep in the ocean. Me too. Personally. Me too. Uh, a million percent. Have you guys seen, there's a YouTube video someone did on it recently. There's these guys that were working on an oil pipe and something happened where they opened it and the pressure sucked them down into this pipe, like on the ocean floor. <laughs> and they had to like, they couldn't see anything and they had the tiny space to crawl in. It was, it was horrifying. Oh it's God. great. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely yeah, you definitely don't, hell. We don't belong in these places. And there's no doubt. No. Whether or we don't belong in space either, but that's just too fucking bad. You know, uh, I was watching uh, I was watching a 60 Minutes, actually, a, a, a part of 60 Minutes this past week about the Artemis program going to the moon and how it's like way over budget. And I was getting really upset watching it because they're like internal money guy or whatever. That's like kind of meant to be skeptical, like uh, their inspector general or whatever was, he was just like, it's just too expensive. Like he didn't care at all. It's like, dude, we're going to the moon, dude. It's exciting. It's cost four billion dollars to go to the moon. Good. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know? Good. Send yeah. send as many people to the moon as possible. We're sending Dustin to the moon. Okay. <laughs> they'll, give, they'll give you a haircut up there. Can I uh, first podcast from the moon? Mm-hmm. I don't know if the connection. I mean, Zencaster barely works here on yeah. land. Yeah, so it's not going to be good up there. It's 200,000 miles away, you know? Yeah. Might be a little, a little latent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little not lag. so bad. I mean, it's not crazy, but it's, it's enough. Several seconds it'll take. Yeah, you know, which, but then again, you're on the moon. Yeah. So I'm not going on the ark and I'm going to the moon. Right. Fair, you're not going on the ark trade. because you're going to the moon. OK, right. good. That means I'm one of the last remaining survivors other than there will be people on the ark and whoever's going with me to the moon. Everyone else is fucked. And a Kevin so. Costner like water world situation where there is actually a society living on top of the water as well. Oh, yeah. okay. But, How are you gonna uh, get to the moon? You gonna trebuchet your? Yeah, I learned all about that from the Xbox event uh, last year. <laughs> the trebuchet. Oh yeah, that's right. Have you, I uh, I always see the things about the space elevator. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the way to get up. It is definitely uh, get- the way to do it. It's just we're not anywhere close to doing it. That would be so no. awesome if we had space elevators. The idea of a space elevator is that you could basically make a tether from Earth, from the surface of the Earth so high into or into low earth orbit that it'll stay straight and taut and then you can get things and it'll basically you can just get things up and down into low earth orbit and that's where we should be building everything it would be so much cheaper and easier to build everything we would need in low earth orbit why because then we wouldn't need rockets yeah um to, to break a big problem with space velocity. junk 
Yeah, it's a huge you know problem space with space junk. Yeah, yeah. That there's like particles. We're basically going to be surrounded by our own uh, garbage and unable to get out. That will be a job so, in the future in the coming hundreds of years is like to get shit out of orbit. Um, yeah, we have to go clean it up. Because yeah, one of those like a, <laughs> even like a bolt, you know, going thirty thousand miles yeah. an hour is going to fucking go through, completely through your spacesuit, through your spaceship, depressurize yeah. it, and fuck it all up. It's amazing. I think a lot of people are amazed that it has doesn't happen already. That. It's not like way worse because there's There's so many derelict things up there, like thousands of things that have been just abandoned. Is it the movie Mission to Mars? Do you ever seen that movie where there's like a there's like a a space junk that hits the ship and and fucks it all up? And then they save the day because they have uh, like a Capri Sun of Dr. Pepper that goes in the ice, fills the hole. Do you remember this? Am I? Am I? No, I, I do this? vaguely remember this. The thing about the thing I remember <laughs> most. I remember two things about Mission to Mars is the most. I, again, that was the, the the era when I went and saw everything in the theater. So I went and saw that in the theater, and it was it got fucked up. The, like midway through, like something messed up, so they had to start the oh. movie again. Which so that's what I remember about that. The other thing I remember is that in the beginning, there's like a party scene with their families, like the astronauts' families, and it's like in the near future, and they have these very futuristic Coke bottles. And that's what I remember mm. about that, about Mission to Mars. That was those are my two major takeaways is the fucking marketing that was embedded in it. And uh, the, 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 the it must have been what, 2000, something like that. And uh, some, yeah, something like this, dude. And they were inspired by Magic School Bus because the guy takes off his helmet in space, just like Arnold did uh, and brutally kills himself. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. Magic School Bus. <laughs> that was like a little after my time, I think. I didn't really like it or watch it. I didn't really understand it. I think I was too old for it. But then again, I've said before that yeah. I was way too old for Arthur and I used to watch the shit out of that show. There's this great video of some some guy going like, oh my God, he did. When Arnold takes his helmet off and he freezes in deep space. It's so, <laughs> yeah. I, I used to have that on my fucking phone as like audio. Oh my God. Oh my God. Dude, Miss Miss Frizzle? Wood. Stand down. Yeah, you could get she can get it. That's interesting. She can Miss Frizzle can get it. Yeah. So, oh man. Oh man. What the fuck is wrong with you, Chris? No, what's wrong fine, with Miss Frizzle? No, Tell me right now what's wrong with her. Let me, let me look let me look her up real quick. Yeah, I'm gonna go just, just take a look here. Miss Frizzle. Oh ew, wait, what happened? Oh the Oh, I forgot no, the they new, had not a the new one. I forgot they had a reboot where like it looks like clip art. She has like she looks young in the new one, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't know, Dustin. You like her? Yeah, she's got like a. She's kind of. Oh, this image didn't work. I she, tried to she send wear, you guys. Miss Frizzle's wear. You know, Miss Frizzle wears that makeup that like w- w- weird white women wear, where they make their eyes almost. They almost look Asian with them, but with the mm. makeup. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Miss Frizzle has that that thing going on with her eyes. Yeah, yeah. I've seen this most, You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I've seen this most recently with that Hannah Gut- Gutierrez woman that was just tried for manslaughter from the the rust. <laughs> She has the she wears makeup like that. The fake, yeah. the fake kind of. I don't want to even say it. We, I feel like we have the strangest, <laughs> we have the strangest reference polls ever. I think. That made such, that was such a drastic turn. It's like Miss Frizzle to this. Oh yeah, that, she looks just like this woman who was tried for manslaughter. Just like, Hannah Gutierrez, you know this person. But I don't know. Why I don't do women wear their makeup about. like that? I don't know. Why, did, yeah. why does anybody wear anything the way they wear it? Really, that's I mean, I true. It's just like you—it's like almost like you slipped. It's like your eye actually ended here. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. What are you in the court of Louis the Sixteenth or something? I don't understand what, what's going on with this ornate, this ornate makeup. <laughs> <laughs> the court of Louis the Sixteenth, of course. All right. By the way, I've been watching this really awesome documentary on YouTube about the the early history of Japan. And it's so well done. And I don't know anything about Japan. Like, mm-hmm. I know a lot about it or more about it when you get to like the 1500s, 1600s into like towards the Meiji Restoration and all that kind of stuff. But we're going way back with these guys. And I'm like, you could be making all of this up. But I don't I don't know, you know, but it's a yeah. wonderful documentary. Yeah. I want to watch that show Shogun. Yeah, I've been hearing be a lot about on Hulu. I heard it's uh, pretty cool. Yeah. But everything I know like about that. ancient Japan is from playing Total War Shogun 2 when I was in college, which uh, is practically nothing. But like creative assembly. cool game. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, don't, I, I know very little about Japan. I think I think we, we had a problem with them at some point and then Godzilla. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. 
Well, we we're totally it's in Japan's interesting because I only took one class in college on Japan. I don't really know anything about it. And I remember, by the way, even in the time, this must have been 2004, 2005. I knew at the time it was like an old white man professor. And I was like, this guy's a huge weeb. Why do oh, you yeah. know Japanese so well? <laughs> and why do you care about this so much? But I remember learning about that. But we all know, I mean, the United States kind of broke Japan open right before the Civil War. And it didn't know how to interact with the Western world and became mm -hmm. like mega imperial. We kind of are the like the little domino that led to World War II. You know, yeah. it led right back to us. I often, we had a, I often think we about had a fuck, like, they fucked around a little bit, didn't they? Oh. Yeah. Do, do you think? Yeah. Do you think if you went back in time and told. Like if you could bring back the spirits of of the, the people who rejected Hitler from art school and just tell them like, hey, by the way. Just so you know, Let me, I, I'm going to pull you out of your permanent peace and your, your inf infinite rest just to let you know that you you killed millions with your with your stinginess. Right. And okay, it's ridiculous because his art isn't even bad. Yeah, it's, not, it's like it's it's, it's not, not bad amazing, at all. He's a but student. Like, yeah, it, it's not even <laughs> like it's not amazing, but it's like it's way better than I could do it. I feel like there's at least a jumping off point here. It's like, why? Did, what? What did they have against him, man? Like maybe yeah, somebody looked weird. Maybe they thought it's like, ew, that mustache is gross. He can't come to our school, dude. I'm <laughs> looking at some of these paintings now, and it's like, Ooh. yeah, they're they're fine. They're like good. It's like I don't understand. I don't understand why you didn't just accept him in art school. They they were so stingy that they killed thousands. It's crazy. Oh, what that's you're that, a, that's you're, a, a, you're a 16 year old that fucking paints these. Uh, these idyllic castle scenes we don't want you you know thanks guys appreciate that i wonder if, i wonder if that runs through anybody's mind when they're rejecting somebody from an art school today uh, like yeah. if, if if you're like in charge of like okay like somebody applies to art school and then you're in charge of determining whether or not they get in i wonder if that thought ever runs into their heads where it's like this could be if i say no to this guy this this could be the next hitler the next fascist dictator mm. of europe you never know yeah yeah Welcome to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. We go live each and every week. You can get us three days early and ad free over on Patreon. Three days, three days early and ad free over on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Last Stand Media. Couldn't do without you over there. Um, early ad free access to every episode of this show and all of our other shows, including Punching Up, our Nintendo podcast, and Defining Duke, our Xbox podcast, and Constellation, our conversational podcast, and Summon Sign, our games discussion, and so on and so on and so on. Different tiers there, but the $5 tier is the most popular, and you'll also get Sacred Symbols Plus once a week. That is our um, our weekly supplement to Sacred Symbols. And we just did a really interesting one that will go live tomorrow from when this goes live on Patreon about emulation kind of spinning off of what happened with the Yuzu emulator for Switch and Nintendo. And so I invited Hogan to talk about it from a legal perspective. And then we had Dagan and Brad on to talk about it and myself to talk about it from a more moral and ethical perspective position and um so i'm sure that conversation is going to annoy some people please enjoy it uh i just interviewed cliffy b which was interesting and i had jonathan blow on the show as well for a fascinating discussion dustin did his japanese interview i think that's live now for everyone on youtube we went into final fantasy 7 rebirth that game is out now so i know a lot of you are enjoying it i talked to mystic ryan recently we have others upcoming i'd like to do a conversation about hell divers at some point and we will certainly do that Josh Kisscalt wrote in on Patreon. Remember, one of the perks over on Patreon is I put up a thread each week in the news feed. You respond to it. I pull through it and grab things that I'd like to talk about. He says, good day, gents. This is a PSA for all other Sacred Symbols listeners. For years, Sacred Symbols has been the only show I listen to from LSM. But Summon Sign has joined the rotation. It's awesome to get deeper conversations about individual games. And Brad is an awesome host. For anyone who may only listen to Sacred Symbols, I think Summon Sign will become a new fave. Dropping LSM a big keep it up. Glad to hear that. Summon Sign is doing wonderful. And we're proud of Brad and we're proud yeah. of all everyone. I, I thought the all stars of February, which was an all time month for us, was were the Dukes. They did a really great job. With all the Xbox news handling all that. A lot of pressure. As there was much to talk about. We can't relate here in PlayStation world. <laughs> Last day media store for merch. And uh, follow us wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Remember, by the way, you might have noticed this if you're an audio listener or if you're a lapsed audio listener, you might even be even more pleased to notice this is uh Started putting timestamps in the audio versions. I've long been against this, but then two things have kind of happened. 
and by the way, I, I guess it's not two things. I'll explain why I was against it first. I was against it because the timestamps are going to be wrong because we have dynamic ads on our audio. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to avoid the like these timestamps are wrong every week thing. So what we've done is we've just approximated as best we can where we think each thing will start. You're going to probably have to scroll around a little bit, but that's just the nature of the dynamic ads. I guess the other reason, though, that I did it even because of that problem that I anticipated is it's just like I use timestamps like that. So like when, when I really became more self-aware that it's like, no, we got to just do this. And so I think people on the audio feeds will like it. By the way, dude, the Spotify feed for Last Stand is so clean when you if you connect to it or whatever, if you're a member or if you just go over there and use it as a free member, it's so clean over there. Spot our Spotify connectivity with Patreon is awesome. So definitely check that out. All right. Let's get into things to talk about here. We have a quick correction. Actually, I guess I'll I'm going to is this two weeks in a row that I fucked everything up? I think so. Oh, it's too bad. Let me see. What happened? Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to drop this down here. Oh, I got to get it together. Fucking it all up. I'm getting the yips as we get closer to episode 300. I'm starting to not be able to perform anymore. Oh, no. As as the need to perform grows and heightens. Mm. Velden Lompax wrote in and said last week during the conversation about the bloated quantity of games releasing nowadays, Colin proposed a radical idea. Cut the droves of games released each year by 60 percent or in his exact words, three fifths. I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree and think more people would welcome this so-called three fifths compromise. What a unique and novel idea that I'm sure has never been proposed for and has absolutely no historical baggage. Godspeed. Thank you, Belden. Lombax. When I use whenever I use the term three fifths, I immediately think of that. Yeah, I and, mean, of course. <laughs> You you said it in the in the episode. I think even if you watch the video podcast, I like my eyes open. Yeah, it's like, like yeah. I, I flash back into like, oh, I'm on Snark Tank, and now I'm going to have like to cut through a five minute barrage of jokes about this that I have to sit and listen to. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. Interesting fraction. Yeah, choose. it is. It's a ruined fraction. But I'll, I'll <laughs> consider this three fifths compromise. Thank you, Belden, for writing it's, in. It's like the fractional. It's like the mathematical equivalent of the the Chaplin stash. Yeah, yeah, sure. Tainted. Yeah, tainted. Chaplin. It's so funny you bring that up because Micah told me, God, who was it? There's like some actress today who's related to Charlie Chaplin who works, who's in something that I I watched. And it was, uh, I'm like, oh, that's so weird. Charlie Chaplin has progenitors. Of course he does. Why wouldn't he? But it's. Not, I don't think her last name's Chaplin, though. It says anyway. Una, Una Chaplin is a Spanish oh, actress. Oh, Una Chaplin, maybe. But like, I don't think that's, I don't think no. that has anything. Oh, no, wait, no. wait. Oh, her mother is Geraldine Chaplin. She's also the granddaughter of English film actor Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Okay. So it's a Spanish actress. Not who I'm thinking of. Is she in Spanish films or is she in? I don't know. I don't know. I shouldn't have brought it up because I have no information. <laughs> okay. I've retained, I've retained nothing about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Colin, Colin Goodspeed with two L's. Wrote in and said, CDC just chiming in as a follow up to the Arby's conversation. This might sound like a weird, subtle bit, but it's actually true. I freelance direct many of the Arby's we have the meats commercials and have for years. If you don't believe me, just Google my name. So if you ever see one of those ad Arby's ads where Ving Rames is talking about roast beef, just know there's an LSM fa fan behind the camera. While I enjoyed the hell out of your genuine roast of them, you should at some point try their beef and cheddar with curly fries and a Jamocha shake. It's surprisingly not too bad. I did look up. Your name, Colin. Wait, good what? I love that recommendation. It's surprisingly not too bad. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, good. Very. I'm sure they're thrilled by that that's, recommendation. That's like you, but that's like how you would describe like a like a colonoscopy that went well. <laughs> but, let's see. He was wow. born in 1986. Colin is a fan of storytelling within multiple multiple mediums. His appreciation of visual language, comedy, and surrealism has been infused into his work as a director and editor. In his free time, Colin likes to go to loud concerts, check out cool stand-up comedians, and watch pretentious art out films. He also spends a weird amount of time actively hating the band Fish and all of their hippie fans. It's not very nice. Why are you such a hater? Direct. He directed the Good Burger 2 promo for oh. Arby's. Bunch of Arby's stuff. He seems like oh. he has a good, uh, good uh, old work spice with them. Too. Yeah, Old Spice. Yeah, you go, you, good for you. Yeah, man, congrats. That's Fanatics? Sick. Oh, you did Fanatics. Now... I fucking hate fanatics. Everyone hates fanatics. <laughs> um, so there is that. And that's a that's a thing against you. Fanatics, of course, is a merch company, but they they are so they are notoriously horrible. 
and there's like entire Twitter accounts dedicated to how bad the uh, the Fanatics merch experience is. I think I'm thinking of the right company. I'm like just bashing a company that that. that <laughs> I'm pretty. Actually, I think I've heard that too. No, it is. I'm looking it up. Yeah, what's so? Yeah, this is right. Fanatic. So this was a big thing in hockey because Fanatics is taking over the hockey jerseys. I think next year from Adidas, and people are freaking out about it. And if you look up the MLB Major League Baseball uniforms this year, they're so bad. They are so bad. They look like little league teams, little boys playing baseball. Colin Goodspeed, thank you for writing in. Stay frosty out there. Mark James wrote in. Oh, he said, okay, now the laxative gate stuff is pissing me off. All right. It's clearly the word they needed multiple times an episode. Colin tells everyone how stupid he is now and how he has no idea what's happening half the time. He smokes so much pot that his brain is scrambled. Dustin told us the episode that he doesn't remember anything he says after the pod wraps. So why do we even listen to him have an opinion about this is frankly (laughs) insulting. Chris is so confidently wrong about more things than anyone I've ever encountered in my life. He's right about a lot of things, but when he misses, he misses hard. The fact Colin has told us every embarrassing thing that's happened to him, but nothing to do with the fact that he can't stand being told he was wrong. He hates it so much. He made a recurring segment in the show and others about him being right about things. I think someone who is that attached to not being wrong has his smoked his brain into a permanent state of semi psychosis might spend an hour of his time trying to convince us otherwise. So as much fun as it is listening to you all jerk each other off over how great your straw man arguments are, how about you just take the hit? Then write the definition of the word down a couple of times so you don't forget it next time. And yeah, Chris, everyone suggested the word fire because you were describing exactly what a fire is. Please keep telling us all that. No, actually, there isn't a word for that that we were looking for. And all the combined of human history, no one ever came up with a word for fire. You three degenerate morons were the first people to ever think about what to call something when it's burning. A lot of people have been writing in about this. It's so ignorantly hostile. I, love I know. It. It's like crazy. You've ever heard the word like conflagration or inferno? Or like other yeah, maybe yeah, more yeah. complicated words for something simple that you would. I mean, come on, let's be real. Open up a dictionary, man, or a thesaurus more <laughs> accurately. I'm a little confused by it. I'm just I, I remain confused. I remain totally flummoxed by what the confusion is. Yeah, I just don't understand anymore. I don't know how else to explain it. And because people are so focused on the word laxative. But what, what what we were saying was that the words we were thinking of were not the right words for the moment anyway. So right. y- you we could be literally thinking of any word because the whole nugget of it is that it's not the right word. <laughs> we were thinking of things that did not mean what you're saying. Yeah. I'm, I'm shutting this whole thing down. Yeah. You know? I'm, just, I'm just convinced that the word doesn't exist. I, I, I could have sworn there was just like a more... A technical term for like a I guess like a I guess a synonym for laxative but laxative is the obvious one I don't know it's weird oh, it's well. just it is what it is you know I do an entire segment of the show with corrections every week if there are corrections there are corrections this week I just I don't feel like the explanation to the conspiracy is sufficient at all it's just not sufficient. There's nothing here. You guys got to let this one go. This is like World Trade Center Building 7. Mm. <laughs> it's exactly like it. Right. By the way, I'm getting fucking pissed off, man. I have oh. this nice keyboard, this DOS keyboard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the back of it is this ruler. But it acts also as like the thing that keeps the keyboard kind of pitched up. If you mm-hmm. want it that way. And it's just suddenly coming off constantly. This keyboard was really expensive. <sighs> I'm sorry, man. I have an Amazon <laughs> basics. <laughs> I got the basic ass. I got this, this standard ass Amazon basic keyboard. Cause I could, I could give less. I, I, if it works, it works. I, I I've bought expensive keywords before and I've always been disappointed because I was, I was like, Oh, this has no functionally. No goddamn difference. On my experience working a computer, it really doesn't. It's just loud, you know. Yeah, isn't it? Bad but even for then, it's it's that, it's, it's it's getting worn in, though. You know, the switches. Yeah, I guess I like. I yeah. do. I understand that. Like, I like the clicks of like mechanical keyboards. Me I too. like it, but I don't Love know if it. I necessarily like it when I'm using it. It's strange. Like, I like it as a sound effect in like movies and stuff. It's like, oh yeah, cool. I like it. But like when I'm using it, it like distracts the hell out of me. Like, I like to have like a silent. I don't know. It's kind of like um on the f- like on the phone 
with uh, the the touch tones when whenever you're like texting and then like the the phone makes like little clicks. I don't mm. like that. And uh, I don't I don't need you to pretend mm. that you it's like a fake sound because I know right. I know from using silent keyboards that you don't that the sound is unnecessary. And so for you to project that sound to me, it just feels kind of like feels like you're trying too hard or something. It's yeah, weird. we got to get like rotary phone noises going now. There is, you have to there's wait nothing seven worse. seconds to, t- to press the next button. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing worse than someone who has the the sound clicks on and you're just kind of s- idly by. This is something my dad's guilty of that he'll be on his phone. It's just like a constant stream of these. And he has it as like full blast, totally unaware. Just, just you know, in his own world. Yeah. It bothers the same, like, you know, part of your, the brain. Colin, we talked about this, the uh, the mouth noises, any kind of little on and off constant sound like that. No, no, no. Yeah. Like the mouth noises are just. Egregious. It's crazy, like, what people get away with, with that. Let's just put it that way. Where there are people making mouth noises so egregious sometimes where I'm like, how do you not know that you're talking like that? What is this? Mm-hmm. You don't think I know that you know that you are you are that's like a dominant position like you're intimidating me (laughs) when you're when you're using mouth noises that egregious like get it together take a drink of water for Christ's sake. Speaking of which. You got to get your water. You're still doing the you're still doing the smart water. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you find because I stopped uh, once I got a filter because I was like, oh, I mean, well, that's the important thing. Remember, is that I fill this up like 17 times once I open it. This is oh, definitely okay. filtered right. water. At this OK, point. good. Yeah, that, that's what that's what I was asking. I was like, yeah, is, yeah. is it like a new smart water every single no, time? No, I, I th- for new and old listeners will remember this, but I told you this before. The reason I got into smart water at all was because of podcasting, because the bottle, no matter what you do to it, makes no noise. You yeah. Squeeze it and manipulate it and molest it as much as you'd like and that was a thing that a lot of people became tuned into during my kind of funny days and so i started drinking smart water and but i feel like it's wasteful to just drink them over and over again they're also really expensive like dagan drinks fiji water but he straight up does drink fiji water and i'm like what are you a fucking Whoa. king you know uh so i like get it and then i have the fridge water and i'll just yeah. fill it up like a few times or whatever and then i'll just get it right, right. at some point because i love That's, the bottle i love these bottles it's a good i would bottle. rather have this bottle than like a reusable stanley cup or something not like uh these bad boys that we got the yeti yeah. they're nice i mean they're really yeah. nice but there's something there's something about discarding it and never using it again after a little while you know like i'm done with yeah. this yeah. yeah, it's a freeing feeling. Right. That, that 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 Yeti mug is like really good for like coffee specifically. Like I like if I have coffee, it's it's going in there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit. It's a. I feel like it's a bit big for coffee. Oh, but I, I drink a lot of coffee. By the American standard, it really yeah. isn't. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Oh, I liked this question. This is a good one. Stretch our gaming legs for a little while. Nicholas Wilson wrote in and said, good day. Oh, by the way, before we get into this, I don't want to hear about laxative gate anymore. You guys lost. Yeah. You have, not, you have not successfully convinced me that you even have the fucking slightest modicum of a grasp on the situation. Not, yeah. You're not even on the right path. No. Stand so down. just give it up. It's over. Okay. Nicholas Wilson. Good day, gentlemen. I'm finally in a financial situa- situation when I can pledge allegiance to LSM after wanting to for many years now. Thank you and welcome. And boy, does it feel fucking good to finally be here. More of a hypothetical one for you. Planet Earth is ending and we have to leave. You have managed to land a position on a ship desti- destined for Proxima Centauri. Someone's been playing Collins games and are all charged with curating one console and five games originally released on that console to live forever live in the annals of human history. What would you pick? Keep doing what you do and never stop. You know, I think about this fairly deeply. Actually, because I think about space travel all the time because I love it. And Proxima Centauri is obviously the closest star system to, to us and is the like the travel to star system in a million things of sci fi, including in the things that I've written for Lilimo. So it's cool to, to be talking about this. The reality is, is that I've thought about this through the lens of YouTube, actually. It's like if you're going on this intergalactic trip and there really is no w- way for you to have a reasonable bandwidth to get things to and from Earth anymore. You have to take everything with you, right? Like it's you're going to get to yeah. a point where you're barely going to be able to communicate survival pings to be picked up 
from your ship. So you're not going to be able to have bandwidth to get like, oh, we'd get the news today and chill. It's not going to happen. And I'm like, could you let's say this. Let's say we start going to other star systems in 100 years, which I think is reasonable. I think this will accelerate very fast, probably after we're dead. It's like, do you have hard drives and all this stuff sufficient enough to be like, all right, we're going to on this thing, tear down all of YouTube as it exists right now. And place it in this hard drive or something like that for access. And so like we could just have access to YouTube and as it was when we left anyway, and it would never be updated. And I wonder if you could do it the same in the future for games where it would be kind of limiting to think it's like, oh, you can only like. It's fun to think about what you're saying from a from a, a thought exercise, Nicholas, but it's like we would go to another star system and only have the ability to bring a few games with us. I don't know about that. Yeah. You know, I think we'd have them all. Just no new games after that, which would be interesting. And even then. Would you be a podcaster on the in the fl- in the flotilla, Chris, talking about video games as you go through <laughs> your catalog on the generation ship and you're going to die? You're not even going to get the Proxima Centauri. Maybe your grandkids will be there. You know? I don't know. I, I feel like I would be too enamored with the fact that I'm on a spacefaring vessel to to be interested in anything other than that fact. I would find some way to be involved with like the ship. I'd be like, what, what can I what can I do for the ship? Because there's I don't know, there's something even with like Firefly. I, I remember and like just like a lot of sci fi, there was always that guy like in the bridge or like in the engineering bay who was like toiling away at something like I, I feel like I would I would want to do that in that scenario. We're like, oh, this vessel. Yeah, this is my ship. Yeah, I know this engine. Oh, well and good. The Shaw Fujikawa space. <laughs> space <laughs> quantum leap engine, whatever the fuck this is. I love the idea of being out. No way. I, I don't think I would be like an entertainer on a vessel like that. I think I'd be too obsessed with that, with just the reality of that. To do anything other than focus on it. What would you think about the what do you think about the ethics of a, a generation ship like that people one generation chooses to go on this this arc basically and then future unborn generations are going to be stuck there no matter what unable to uh, leave and they'll live and die on the ship and they won't even get to their destination it's very interesting i don't, yeah. I don't, I don't I, is there an ethical quandary there at all really i think so. in some case oh, yeah. i mean you have no free anything in that and you're born into a situation where with not even it's not even like you're born into a slave camp or something you're born into space in the yeah. middle of interstellar space you have no choice nothing I, you are a slave i, I guess yeah. but you don't you, you don't really have a choice to be here anyway like i like i didn't i didn't apply for this you know what Planet i mean like, Earth's pretty different than a single spaceship it is though. but like it's it's similarly isolated in the grand scheme you know like i, like, I, I don't <laughs> what I, alternative I, though that's what i'm saying like, <laughs> it's like there is no there's no alternative but like i just don't you're just in your situation anyway. Like I, I don't, I don't really see it as like really that much of an ethical problem at all. Wow. Hmm. Because ultimately like what, people who, people who are going to grow up on the, or people who are going to go on the, uh, the generation ship, right. They choose to do that. Right. They're choosing the, to go the on people, the, the generation there's a, the, Yeah. The first generation of people on the generation ship would choose to be there and they would basically enslave future generations to the ship until they got to their destination. However long it would take. You know, if you went to Proxima Centauri, which is like four light years away, and you went 0.5 or or 5% of light speed, which is probably a reasonable estimation for how fast we would be able to go for a while, you're, you're talking about 80 years. So in that case, it's you're, you could imagine a, a young child getting to, to Proxima Centauri, but anything beyond that would require yeah multiple generations of ships this is what twin breaker is about by the way our game if you ever want to check I, it out i guess i guess to me i look at it like well the kids are going to be born in that situation and that's going to be their world and they're not really gonna they're not gonna feel really like what, what are they gonna miss really the, the entire context of their existence is on that ship and i guess you i guess technically you've stolen that the rest of the context of earth from them in some way but i don't know i i feel like that's equivalently as unethical as having a kid in the first place and be like forcing a consciousness into existence that didn't really, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't nobody applied to be born. You know what I mean? That's so fair. Like, just, I, I how ju- do you tell a person who's like been like depressed or like suicidal for like 90 years or something? You know what I mean? Like that, that like, I, I, I don't know, even if they're on earth, it, these are free, free, f- this is free will really ultimately. Mm. I don't know. I don't feel like that's big of a deal. We'll leave it there for now. We can revisit this on Constellation in the future. 
Yeah, it'll be fun. All right. Jason wrote in and said, Colin, I am reluctantly yeah. writing. Oh, sorry, what? Wait, question. Do we want to answer oh, the yeah, question? No. Oh, about yeah, the games? No, I, I, don't, I don't even remember <laughs> what the question was. Oh, yeah, no. I, my answer is that there, there would be no situation in which that would be true. So I can't even begin to answer that. Sorry. Go ahead, Dustin. I, forgot I wrote that. out five games. Oh, you did? In oh, the okay. console. Initially, I realized because I wrote PC, but then I realized that's not a console, really. But all these games are on PlayStation 5, so we could just say PS5. I wrote Tetris Effect for remembering the beauty of the Earth. Civilization, so you can get a weird fucked up version of history that never happened. Minecraft for different creative outlet. Undertale for the empathy of humanity. And I put Bioshock just because everyone should play it and it's awesome. So those are my five because I, I thought of it from approach of like these are five games that can represent different aspects of us as humans going out. Not necessarily the best five that you want to play forever and ever. Mm, yeah, well, you could take it different ways. I think we'll just have all the games. <laughs> OK, we'll have endless entertainment in these situations. Yeah. All right. I'm going to Jason now. Are we good to go on, move on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Colin, I am reluctantly writing in from a place of great shock, concern, and disgust. I feel like I must speak up about a great evil that has been perpetrated. Last week, you responded to someone who mentioned they work for DoorDash delivery. You had given them the following advice. Quote, I hope everyone is giving you the appropriate tip, and if they don't take one of those curly fries, and if they don't, take you got to use commas here uh, to properly represent what I said. Take one of those curly fries and insert it into your anus and then put it back into the carton. End quote. How do you write all that without a comma? Do I need to explain how incredibly egregious this is? Do you really think this is okay to be inciting such acts of vile hatred from your followers? Disgusting. As a responsible tax paying adult who occasionally uses delivery services like these, I find this to be an unforgivable incident. And I am shocked and appalled to hear these things come from your mouth. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt here. And I honestly see no way of giving of wriggling out this out of this one. So please help me try and understand. And please help me fight back against the urge to not only unsubscribe, but to contact the proper authorities. Jason. Jason, what authorities Jason. are you going to contact? What do you deconstruct what you're saying to me right now? Jason, the Internet police, Jason, Jason, <laughs> hit the hit the Jason button. Jason, <laughs> press X to Jason, hit press X. Yeah, exactly. Press X to Jason. You're acting like I, I wish you were lost in the mall like Jason was in heavy mm-hmm. rain because my suggestions do not equal like reality i'm not i i can say whatever i want and you doing the act is still you doing the act do you not take any so the if the doordash driver which i guarantee you has already thought about all the different ways they can fuck with your food because they deal with assholes all day um they're, they don't need any ideas from me but if i said doordash drivers you should take the curly fry from arby's and tickle your asshole with it and then put <laughs> it back in the carton that's my free speech yeah mm. This is the United States. Um, so go ahead and call the authorities. Maybe you should call the fucking clown university. Go back to it. Oh, <laughs> is that re- our clown college is real? Is that real? There must be a place where you're trained to be a clown. Because I heard that. I know what I know exactly what you mean, where it's like I there must be. But at the same time, like I cannot I've never like driven by like, you know, oh, Pasadena clown college. You know, like I've never seen that. Am I, clown, <laughs> clowns without borders. Uh, <laughs> I found the link. Clowns Top clown schools borders. in the U.S. What clowns the f- without borders dot com. Let's see. That is a wild. Top clown school in the U.S. includes insider reviews. Wow. This clown is- templation questions to help you find your best clown. Oh, <laughs> your best fit clown school. I just <laughs> think. All right. So here's my honest opinion about this. <laughs> We don't need clowns anymore. Right. Of course. Yeah. Reality has given us more than enough clowns. See, clowns come from an era where there wasn't wasn't nearly this level of clown, just general clownishness. Or you just didn't know about it because you had no way of. Right. Well, that's right. It was more guarded and sheltered and localized, you know. So, yeah, of course, you, you live a normal life and, you know, fucking any town USA. Of course, you need some doofy looking dude in a white you know, white paint on his face, juggling bowling pins. But I don't yeah. feel like I need that now because all I can, I can just go on Twitter where 
any number of people are debasing themselves at any given time. Right. And I don't need the clownishness like that anymore. It's too literal. It comes from a different world. It's Were almost ever- like clowns today are almost like making fun of today by even suggesting that you wouldn't be needed, like your presence is needed. <laughs> yeah. Right. Have you, were, have, did you ever have an irrational fear of clowns? Sweeney has, an, has a fear of clowns. My sister Dana does. Uh, I don't. We used to scare the shit out of her intentionally when we were kids based on, on her yeah, fear yeah. of clowns. But yeah, I, I personally am not afraid of them. I'm confused by them. Yeah, there's, I, I, would, I would put it that, like I had a deep, I would say I had a deep aversion to them. Because I remember I would, I would my, my family would take, like, we would walk through, like, Central Park or whatever, and there would always be, there, there's all sorts of buskers and performers there. And I remember this one instance where, like, there was a clown, like, just sort of, like, doing some, I don't know, some clown shit. And I looked at it, it was, like, my first cognizant understanding and registering that, like, oh, that's a clown. And I remember distinctly feeling, that's not a person. Like that's that's like as a child with no preconceived biases at all. Like I, I didn't see clowns in cartoons or like make a note of it. I just saw a clown in the real world and thought that's less than a human being. Right. And it's interesting. Intrinsi- oh. Intrinsically. Because mm-hmm. it's like that's a, it's a demon like that. That paint they they have on the the, the, the forced smile mm-hmm. and like the, the pale white. That's a fucking. That's a lich or something like that's not. That's something right. to be contained. That's not. Yeah. That's not like a free. That doesn't have a. That per, that a clown does not have a social security number. You know, in my head, not in my mind. No, well, they shouldn't because they're not paying. They're probably not making enough money to pay into social security anyway. So why would they even? They have to live off the grid. There's. A, we have a. We have at least one destitute clown listener, who's like re, who's crying right now. But he's but he's smiling still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He looks like a Joker henchman. Yeah, it's it's the first scene of Joker when he's put when he's putting the makeup on. And he's cry, and he's crying. Mm-hmm. Man, yeah, clown. I mean, teach their own. If you want to clown around, I'm just saying that you don't need to be a clown to clown around. We all know it, right? Yeah. And look at this show. Right. <laughs> yeah, this is a clown show in and of itself. Yeah, clown of the year, nine years running. <laughs> I love that video. Oh man. All right. That makes that that circ that video. I don't know if you guys know it's circulate. It's from like some clown documentary that Vice did or whatever or something. And it's just a clip of a guy saying like, oh, this is this guy clown of the year, nine years running. And it, they someone just clips that and it's always circulated in sports circles That's when good. a team loses over and over again. Yeah. OK. All right. Now I have the correction. It's kind of a correction, not really a correction, but more information. Let's say Publius 616 wrote in. Said, hey, all just a quick note for you. During the Helldivers discussion, Colin asks why the meta is called that. Just wanted to let you know it's an acronym for most efficient tactical advantage. Sweats think not using meta strategies and weapons is equivalent to throwing the match. It's the most annoying thing when you're just looking for some fun in a game. Take care, gents. I didn't know it was an acronym. Yeah, I didn't know either. I knew what it meant. Like, I knew the idea that it conveyed. Like, I knew that it conveyed the idea of like, oh, yeah, this is like the best equipment to have for for whatever we're, for whatever situation we're going to embark on but i, I actually didn't know it was a, a an actual it's acronym an, it's an acronym like scuba is an acronym like no one cares that scuba is an acronym because we don't use it like that anymore but it is right exactly you know um but we just call it scuba like little s little c and so on and so forth so that's interesting to know it sounds this is the kind of shit that makes me not want to play online games is like oh i don't have the right set up to be in your match it's like i i guess that you're right i don't want to be with people that don't want to play with me but it's uh, i actually we'll get into what we're playing in a little while but i have not played hell divers all week i think I'm, I'm kind of i'm not over it right now but i did i did kind of hit a wall one night where i'm like this is the same thing over and over and over again at some point i need more than this you know um mm-hmm. now i'm just playing for trophies at this point so i'm like okay maybe i'll go back and get them there's a gold trophy well we'll, we'll save it we'll save it i'll get to it but Publius, thank you for writing in. I did want to acknowledge, though, and we'll get into a few smaller news items here now as we get into what we're playing in a little while. New patch for Helldivers out uh, over on Steam. You can read a pretty extensive and um, lengthy list of updates and fixes and so on and so forth. They also have a list of known issues, which is kind of cool. So things that they would like to take a look at. You can check that out. It's minor patch 01.000.100. I still don't know why companies 
use patch note numbers like this because you don't have to. I know that for a fact. <laughs> so it's like, why are you making it? Like, why couldn't it just be a minor patch 1.0 or something? Colin, this patch is kind of controversial from what I'm seeing oh, yeah? online. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we could, uh, I, I don't have a lot to say about Helldivers. Did they fuck I with the a little bit. What? Did they fuck with the breaker shotgun? The broken ass shotgun? Because that's so. a rules. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think they well, that's the problem. A lot of people are mad because they basically nerfed a bunch of weapons. They buffed the flamethrower, which is cool. But uh, the the gun that I was using, the rail gun, it was kind of like this nice system where you see a charger, you blow off his legs, his the armor on his legs and you shoot at him. Uh, it just doesn't do anything now against armor. They just it just bing, flies off. So it's people are starting to feel a little frustrated that they include all these armored enemies in the game and they are only removing ways to combat armored guys yeah so i kind of agree with that from what i played a little bit last night i did go into a match because i always would go in with a machine gun like call down a machine gun and call down a like a companion droid or whatever yeah. and i saw that a lot of people were using the railgun, and so i i called it down one match and I'm not bragging at all because I'm not good at the game, but I am often the person who killed the most people or the most enemies in a match. I don't know why that is. I think it's because of the specific setup I have where I'm just mowing these oh, smaller yeah, enemies yeah, down yeah, while people are yeah. taking care of the bigger guys. But I, I switched that out for the railgun. This was probably the last time I played, actually. And I just couldn't use the thing like I, I'm like because I, I saw what people were doing with it, like aiming at the legs and all that. And I just felt like I wasn't doing anything. And then you get to the end and I killed literally like 35 enemies or something. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like I might as well not even have been here because I'm trying to use this fucking gun. So I don't know. I, and that I think it was obviously before it was updated, but I didn't even know how to do it. I don't, I think I've kind of reached my ceiling in terms of how I'm going to play. Like I found my, my build. I think the only thing that mm -hmm. I want to switch out is maybe get rid of the little robot companion for the shield. I oh, saw yeah. oh, they nerfed that too. Oh, they did. I don't know how bad I, I haven't really used it, but I saw that. That's People too bad, man. I mean, it. I, I, the game seems, I mean, maybe I'm crazy, but the game seems legitimately hard to me. Like the, I, the, the, the levels I've been, I've been messing only in level six and seven yeah. and, and it goes up to eight and nine. I haven't even unlocked those yet. Or I think I unlocked eight. I just haven't gone to it yet. And then seven, it gets insane. Like, like where I'm like, holy fuck. Like there's no way out of this. We're surrounded by a million of these different things. Like, well, how much harder do you need this game to be? This is not even the hardest difficulty. They better be careful <laughs> with that shit. You know? I'll be interested yeah. to see anyway. I'm getting ahead of myself. Horizon Forbidden West comes to PC. Finally, as we know, March 21st. It comes by way of Nix's. We're going to talk about them shortly. But they released the minimum specs for the game. Any thoughts here, PC nerds, about what they show us? Very low, 720p at 30 frames. Is that the way you're going to play it, Dustin? Oh yeah, definitely. I, you know I love 30 FPS gaming. Uh, this yeah, looks at 720. <laughs> at 720 <laughs> on PC. That's why, dude. That's why I play on like the, the best original PC. Bioshock. <clears throat> uh, this looks pretty reasonable to me. The high settings are set for like 1440p. 60 is a 3070, and that doesn't sound too bad to me. But I mean, so far the Nixus PC ports have all been pretty well optimized and the ones that I mean the PlayStation PC ports that haven't been very good were not done by them so I think it seems safe but it's always good you can't trust PC releases always wait yeah until at least later in the day of launch day to know if it's not broken it um, really is a sad reality that that's just a it, it really is not a safe bet at all yeah or interesting oh, I'm the sorry, lowest go ahead. Go ahead. the lowest is for storage still requires an SSD. Um, and which is interesting because you could play Forbidden West on a PS4 with a mechanical hard drive. Mm. But for PC, they're requiring an SSD. I don't know. Are either of you going to play Forbidden West on PC? It's probably going to be beautiful, but I have obviously no interest in playing it. Maybe if they ever could. No. I, I have this fantasy that they're one day going to connect these games to the PSN and give them their own set of trophies, in which case there would be a third mm. way to dip. And then I'd be in on it again. Yeah. But interesting. But not like not like this. Not you guys like don't really that. like Horizon, though, because you have no taste. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No taste. <laughs> no taste. COVID <laughs> er er eradicated my taste. You got long COVID. Yeah. That's why you it's over. play all these bad games. 
I'm sick of people judging me for my taste. I have impeccable taste in video games. Impeccable. All right, guys, more serious mm-hmm. note. This game, Bola- Bolatro or Bolatro or whatever that it was that we, we talked about. I think it's Bolatro. Yeah. We talked about this game last week. By the way, this game has sold more than half a million copies. Um, we talked about it just because a lot of people were. Oh, I talk, I, I, So let's recall what, what was said. I mm. usually don't just randomly talk about one off games or whatever that people write in about because there's not enough time in the world to do that. But a bunch of people, when I was going through the, the notes last week, I was like, oh, this, is, this person wrote in about this game, Bellatro. And then I'd get like 10 more letters down and I'd be like, oh, another person wrote in about it. And then I was like, all right, well, and then get 20 more down. It's another person. I'm like, all right, I guess I should make note of this game. Mm-hmm. And it's cool looking. I, I definitely want to get to it. It's like, damn, there's just so many games right now. I, I am personally overwhelmed. Clarissa, or I guess it would be um, not the Clarissa era, but uh, Sabrina, the teenage witch of all the pancakes or whatever that she's eating. And she's got like, all oh. things in her hands, you know, it's like Clarissa I, explains I, it all. Right. Yeah. I, but was it from Clarissa or was it from Sabrina? That's what I was saying. Like, it seems like she's oh, older I, in that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's Sabrina. But yeah. I could. I don't know. My memory for that is very, very suspect. All right, sport. So, Bellatro. Something's going on with this game. It's interesting. I don't know if you guys have paid attention. They wrote about this. At least the publisher did. Playstack. On their Twitter account, it says, quote, to our amazing fans, we are aware that Bellatro has been temporarily removed from sale on a number of digital stores in some countries on console platforms, meaning that some new customers will be unable to buy it. Presently, we cannot estimate with complete confidence which stores it will be removed from, but our hope is that only a minority of stores will be affected. We're high, highly confident that the game will remain available on PC stores, including Steam. Anyone who has already purchased the game will still be able to play it. Please rest assured we are working as hard as we can to get the game back on sale as soon as possible. This is not an issue with the stores themselves. However, a reaction to an overnight change to Bellatro's age rating from 3 plus to 18 plus by a ratings board without any advance warning due to a mistaken belief that the game contains prominent gambling imagery and material that instructs about gambling. Bellatro does not allow or encourage gambling, and we fundamentally believe that ratings decision is unfounded. Bellatro was developed by someone who is staunchly anti-gambling, and painstaking care has been taken to ensure the game does not feature gambling mechanics of any kind. We are specifically disappointed in the actions of the ratings board as we specifically addressed this topic with them on October and were given a 3 plus rating after it had initially been rated 18 plus. During that specific appeal, the ratings board assured us, quote, we have reviewed your product and determined that the disclosure of gambling themes was unwarranted, end quote. The game content has not changed since the age rating was amended to a 3 plus. Um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to this. This is pretty brutal um, and, unf- and unfair. Now, it doesn't affect us domestically in the United States. As I understand that this is not a problem here. But it is in certain European play, um, locales. Bellatro is fundamentally about playing cards, as I understand it. But that is different than gambling. Yeah. And even the nature of gambling, dude, I've said before on the show, and it's a big joke in my family. I started playing poker when I was like five and six. I was the youngest of all my neighbor kids. <clears throat> and we would gamble real money, but we had no real money. So no one cared. It was like a dollar. <clears throat> this yeah. is kind of silly. I, I don't like when institutions place themselves in between products and the market for arbitrary reasons that are going to cost them. There's no doubt that people went and looked for the game and will never look for it again. They're like, oh, it's not there. And then many people will go back and look for it again or buy because they want it. But a lot of people won't. Those are lost sales forever. This is uh, messed up. And I'm sorry that this happened to them. But I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to it. I just wanted to acknowledge it. Yeah. And That's that this wild. game is kind of picking up a little bit. It's a wild story. And, and to be fair, I do think I, I, if what they're saying is true and they have like a like understood like and, and confirmed confirmation that like they themselves cleared it for all those themes, this this could potentially be a pretty good boon for them in some way you know what i mean like this this controversy because in, in some ways it kind of ensures that they're going to find their way back on those storefronts it assure it kind of assures that they're going to get that appeal back to a three plus and there's going to be a lot more eyes on it because now there's kind of like a a big to do about it um so this could actually end up working in their favor in the long run but in the short term like that's that's pretty yeah that's a brutal and really random fucking situation for a game like this to go through the important thing for people to note with rate like age ratings and we do this do this at lilymo all companies do this is you pay a certain fee to get rated and so like with the esrb it's like a, a couple thousand dollars or something i think and you have to kind of self-present and it's done under contract so they don't play your game they yeah. don't touch your game you when the game is done you send them a copy of it for their master library or whatever you actually have to send a few copies for their master library but 
you present to them what would fit into the various categories in an honest way. So it's like, oh, is there like drug use? Well, then you have to like go into that and alcohol use. So I, I use the example that we actually had a little bit of a problem. It didn't really end up mattering, but in super peril and super perils of baking, which is really more aimed at a younger audience. I wrote, a, you know, it's all poetry. And in the, the intro poem, it talks about how like one of their parents is like a bartender because they're all like culinary related. And we had to like make note of like alcohol use. But mm. we didn't even think to do that or whatever. So we had that kind of got caught. Which is cool, but generally speaking, it's like, is there bad language and so on and so forth? So what's kind of shitty about this, as I read it from the outside, and this is just conjecture, but just based on my own interactions with the, these age rating boards is like, they're basically being kind of tacitly accused of misrepresenting their game. And that's yeah. somewhat serious. And I don't think that they did. So it it's why you need people that really know what they're talking about analyzing these games. Um, because you 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 simply don't find companies intentionally lying about their games because they would get in a massive amount of trouble without an ESRB rating or a Peggy rating or whatever. You can't go on any store. You can't be sold like at a, at a normal market. I'm not even sure if you can sell your game independently without an ESRB rating, like legally. Because people have to remember the ESRB was kind of the make good between the government and the market so that they wouldn't get involved themselves. Very similar to the Motion Pictures Association of America to rate movies and rate movie trailers and all that. So I, I know that's kind of a weird tangent, but I kind of that's kind of why I feel bad for them because it's suggesting to them that they misrepresented their product when it seems like the people that are looking at the product simply doesn't, they, they don't understand it. So mm. good luck. Yeah. And I, I'm definitely going to buy your game at some point. It's just, again, too many things to play. We're going to get into a few of those things in a little while. Dustin, I was curious what you thought of this. First of all, Persona was in the series going all the way back to Revelations, the PS1 original game, has surpassed 22.6 million copies sold across the entire series, which is exceptional. So congratulations to them. But I saw Push Square report that Persona 3 Reload, which is doing very well on the market, selling a lot of copies and doing well with its scores, is getting a so-called Episode Aegis release in September as part of an expansion pass. So is this the first time that there has been an, a story expansion for a Persona game or did Persona 5 technically get a story expansion too? Although I guess it was part of like a, a whole new version of the game. So what, what yeah. is this seems? I don't know. This seems very unusual to me as, from the on the outside. I don't I don't know if it is, though. I'll save you a little bit from the comments just because and I know that the name is written weird, but it's I guess. Uh, so I so well, I guess that people, that does make yeah. sense. That's so just you, not a, that's you know, just not a word. So I assumed it was you know an actual word like ages. <laughs> oh no, it's all good. I I hate <laughs> being corrected and correcting people on titles, but I know that some annoying person is going to go in the comments. But yeah. Dustin didn't even correct Colin when he said the name wrong. Yeah, no, I appreciate so, that. It sucks that you have so, to worry about that, but that's true. Yeah. So with Persona, traditionally, um, starting I believe with Persona Three, but I might not be correct on that. They've done these new versions that are re-released. So there's original Persona 3, and then they did Persona 3 Fess. And then Persona 4, the improved version with new content was Persona 4 Golden. They did the same thing with 5 to 5 Royal. Now, Reload is a bit different since it is a remake of the original game and includes a lot of the Fess stuff, but it did not include this expansion or this kind of it's a it's a separate mode to my understanding because I've not played it that takes place after the main story. And it was just originally included in that fest version on PS2. But for reload, it was not included and now being sold as DLC, which is annoying to some people. And I kind of get it, but it doesn't really bother me that much. But in terms of actual DLC, this is, yes, the first story-based DLC to come to a Persona game. And they're doing it in this expansion pass format, which is really annoying to me because they're doing it in three waves. And basically, wave one is background music changes. Wave two is more background music and new costumes. <laughs> and then wave three is the actual DLC. I have no interest in owning any of that other bullshit. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if I can buy just the the dlc the wave three episode i guess on its own i hope so but it's uh it's exciting for me just because i really wanted to play i've always you know now that i've beaten the game i know that there's this epilogue thing that wasn't available to me it already seemed like this was going to happen people had 
data mined the files and found evidence that they were going to do this. So it's not a surprise, but it's a a welcome announcement either way, just because I'm I, dude. I loved Persona 3 Reload, one of my favorite games of the year. And I'm so curious about this, this DLC that many people said was really, really awesome in the original. Well, congratulations to Atlas for 22.6 million copies. You have, mm, let me think here. Certainly Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy are both well above that, but that might be number three. The only competitor in the JRPG space would be Tales, like to reach that number. And there are many more Tales games. But mm. I don't really know if they've if they've ever said that Tales would have sold more than 22.6 million copies. So they would either be in third or fourth place in the genre, which is very impressive for such a small. I mean, they're obviously with Sega now, but they weren't always in it. They kept trucking in. It's just amazing watching this thing turn into a I remember I've, I've said it before that when I was a journalist, I remember when Persona 5 was announced with that image, with the red image, with the it was like the, the seats in the classroom or something yeah. and like the jail kind of thematic story, sort of thing going on. And that was like a huge story. People were just amped and you could tell that persona was about to pop off. All right. I didn't really know if we were going to talk about this or not, but many people wrote in about this. Many, many, many people. So let's go to Kale Ng. He says, hey, Sacred Simps, it's been a while since I wrote in. I hope everyone is doing much better than the news here. It was recently announced that Rooster Teeth is shutting down. I remember the early days where I enjoyed videos of Red versus Blue, Ruby and Death Battle. On top of the shows, Rooster Teeth also owned a few subsidiaries like Funhouse, Inside Gaming, and other former Machinima shows. What do you guys make of this announcement? What do you think ultimately doomed Rooster Teeth? Is this a sign post for other internet media companies? What lessons will slither out of this destruction of this once relevant internet giant? Keep up the great work. So Variety is this, the place, Variety.com, broke this news, and they wrote, that they're shutting down after 21 years. There will be some surviving shows from their network, I guess, for now. But all 150 people that work there are going to be laid off. And it's kind of the end of a, a notorious, I don't know, notorious is not the right word, that, that indicates it's bad, a, a famous brand. And mm -hmm. one that I have personal and business connections to going back quite a ways. And I'll talk about all that. But yeah, I'm curious what you guys think of Rooster Teeth going away. It does seem like the end of an era in some way. Rooster Teeth was a very relevant brand, but when you read the variety story, and Chris will go to you first, mm. what becomes obvious is that Rooster Teeth has been mega un uh, unprofitable for a very long time, has not made money in years, and way overhired and way overshot. And knowing what I know about the company and my own interactions with it, I believe that. So it's like the most believable thing in the world that they're over their skis. Yeah. So what are your thoughts, especially from a YouTube front, since you are a YouTuber? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to be to be um, transparent, I do know some people who worked at Rooster Teeth and who are now not uh, uh, a handful of people who are very, very cool. And I like them a great deal. But yeah, man, I, I Rooster Teeth was a big deal in like high school for me because it was the first time like when i when i stumbled across red versus blue it was the first time that i had considered like oh you can like make movies in video games and that's like something that people will watch and that's kind of amazing <laughs> that's insane really because i remember really wanting to make movies at that time and like really want but not having like i don't have equipment i don't have like access to like special effects or like explosions that the, the editing software that exists now uh, on your phone is, is like eons ahead of anything that i had access to on a on a full desktop pc as a kid so i remember thinking like oh this, this is like a cheat code where you can use video games because there's already there's game engines with explosions and vehicles and weapons and free floating cameras and it's like this is actually really interesting and that's how i started making stuff on youtube was really shitty machinimas that i would never post today <laughs> but but i was like 11 or whatever but the yeah the, so they were pretty instrumental to me even starting um on youtube there were other influences too but they were no doubt really huge um uh, obviously red versus blue is a big deal i fell off of it kind of like around 2014 personally they acquired some people from um uh, machinima that i had really appreciated the inside gaming guys who i thought were just so ahead of their time funny uh and that was like a cool move that was nice to see that but i don't know i just sort of fell off as i, as I started making my own content 
I just sort of uh, all the stuff that I was watching kind of fell by the wayside just to pursue that. But yeah, it's a highly relevant brand for for me. So I mean, it's it's sad to see it. At the same time, not necessarily surprised by this. And I was actually listening to um, Bernie Burns. Um, he has a uh, he was like one of the I think he's like the, the founder of of Rooster Teeth. I'm pretty yeah, sure. he, was, yeah. he was he he named the company. I know that. Um, and he was always somebody that I uh, uh, from his appearances on the podcast and just like what, what he did with that company. Uh, I always admired and uh, was very interested in. Um, and I remember when he left, he left many, many years ago. And he has a new like morning show now called like Morning Somewhere where he talked about it. And uh, apparently there's like some good severance stuff going on from wb for some people so that's that's good like they're they, they seem to be doing a decent job of like taking care of some of the people at the very least who have been let go um but yeah it's just they haven't been relevant to me for a while it's not necessarily surprising there were a lot of scandals by the way in the, in the last couple of years the last like four years in particular where there are some really some really unsavory stories that i won't get into now because i don't know if <laughs> I, I don't want to say any. I don't want to say anything that I would have to preface with alleged, but all that information is, you know, you can look it up. Um, it's unfortunate. It's always sad when uh, a, p- a bunch of people lose their jobs, but uh, you know, hopefully that uh, hopefully the people there who were making art that resonated with people can go on to continue doing that. Um, and hopefully, if there's any shows that are still in the works that hopefully they make maybe they can get a final season wrap up or or, or so, some closure through some and i know they're shopping i know warner brothers is shopping around some of those ip like ruby and um some other things so there's hope for that but yeah it's sad what do you think dustin what are your thoughts yeah well just to elaborate on one thing chris said because i kind of had the same experience where i remember what was so cool about red versus blue is that there were tons of videos on the internet that were stupid, um, you know, like YouTube poop or whatever of like <laughs> random halo stuff or like yeah. short 30 second thing. And red versus blue was so incredibly unique because it was an actual show with characters and, and a plot and a story just made within halo. And at, at the time it was like, man, how do you even think of doing something like that? And it, it's so funny just cause it's by this, this like random thing that in Halo, if you character looks all the way down, their head looks up. So yeah. like, oh, maybe we can when you when you look up and down, when your character's looking all the way down, it kind of looks like their heads bobbing, like they're talking. And then an entire show is born out of that. So definitely a, in, in that terms, like extremely influential, not necessarily to me and what I wanted to do, but just opening to my eyes about like, whoa, this kind of stuff is possible. People are creating actual content online where you want to tune in and see the next episode. The thing about Rooster Teeth as a company, and this is this is purely just my outsider looking at what I've seen and not really following them, is that I feel like I stopped hearing about them once they got sold. Yeah. Um, and it was funny when we were talking about this in the staff chat, I think I said that I kind of forgot they even existed for the last few years. And then I realized like, oh, the last time I heard about Red versus Blue or not Red versus Blue, but Rooster Teeth, other than that logo change that everyone hated, right, yeah. was them getting sold. And I, I particularly remember listening to them talk about it like nothing's going to change. The, the people we're selling to are really cool. We're going to keep doing our thing. And I don't know if that's the case. Uh, maybe things change. Maybe they didn't. Like I said, I wasn't really tuned into their content, but there is something to be said about them going away from being in te- independent. Seemingly to me was the the beginning of the end. And so it's unfortunate and it sucks for all the people that that worked there and are losing their jobs. So there's a lot of good talent out there because the stuff they made was high quality. I mean, Ruby, Ruby is probably one of their most surprising successes in that it was this Western made anime style CG show that really took off. And that's really not that common for 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 a team in, in Texas to make something that that competes on that level is pretty crazy. So definitely um, forerunners in, in the space of not just online content, but in a lot of different types of content. Um, yeah, I was 
I haven't thought, I don't really think about Rooster Teeth either. The, the, the weird, the weird reality is, is that because I came from old school, well, I, I came from like the second generation of press, like not pre- print media, which was killed by online media. I was part of the online media generation. And we like looked at Rooster Teeth and others when I was at IGN as competitors, but kind of not really relevant to what we were doing. And I just wasn't very familiar with it. I wasn't into YouTube at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, they sold themselves to full screen in 2014, which was a wise move on their part and made lots of money, and made the founders all millionaires. I think there are like seven or eight of them. And when I co-founded Kind of Funny, we found ourselves in the orbit of Rooster Teeth very quickly because one of our co-founders was obsessed with the company and wanted to really make Kind of Funny a Rooster Teeth-like company, which I was against simply from a size point of view. Um, like I was like, I don't really that's not what i really want to do with my life but we were in with them and i must say that there were a lot of interesting positives including personally like there's a lot of really nice people there like i knew bernie personally and he was always very nice to me um you know jeff ramsey was always really nice to me gus was always nice to me there were some people that were less than nice to me especially after what went down with me and kind of funny that guy blaine for instance like went after me for i don't know whatever um and others but oh yeah yeah. but generally speaking i had like really pleasant experiences with a lot of people there and kind of funny was associated with them as kind of like an an orbiting moon where like they didn't own us but they were selling our merch that we were kind of in the let's play family they were i think selling our ads for us at some point and so on and so forth and we used to go down there to austin to their headquarters like fairly often i ended up going there like four times i think in my short time at kind of funny to film things and like go to meetings and all of that. And I guess reading the news about them and like the the reality of their finances makes it a lot more clear that my instincts about them were as a business were right, which was, I could be wrong about this. It could just be a massive warehouse space or whatever, but I think that Rooster Teeth's headquarters is like an old airport or like some like, like crazy. It was, it was was an old airport hangar. Right. And This was like an extensive space, like an like extensive series of buildings and like acres and acres and acres and acres of land, just like labyrinthine paths to all these different locations. And I remember thinking in my head, like. Who's paying for this? Like the, it's an, it's an incredibly cool thing to have all of this space, but like, why do you need all of this space? And then I remember going in to one of their buildings where Ruby was made. And in my experience, where Ruby was made, looks like a game dev studio, like just scores of people. And I'm like, where what's going on here? Like, I don't understand. And then you would go to this huge warehouse set with mm-hmm. all of these roving sets. And I'm like, you guys do all this for a podcast. And it's not to be a dickhead, but my instincts on the financial front were totally right, because if the Variety's reporting is true from the moment full screen bought them in 2014. So before I had anything that, you know, kind of funny or anything, I had anything to do with them. They never made another dollar of profit. And you could see it. And I remember thinking at the time, like, this seems so out of whack with what I think we're trying to do. Now, I was wrong about what we were trying to do at that time. It, it, it's not like this is more what I had envisioned something very small. Right. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that Rooster Teeth is emblematic of this idea that you can corporatize something that is generally and genuinely revolved around personalities, very specific personalities, and think you can mechanize it like it's a factory or a conveyor belt of goods that come off of it. And the reality is, is that the vibe I got going there. And again, it's not the people like the people there were sweet. Like, it's just the model. It's like, yeah. we're not superstars. This isn't Hollywood. What is this? You yeah, know, like, I don't understand what the point of this is. Yeah, and they- <laughs> and it, it's kind of a bummer looking back how much that infected a vision that I had for something else. When my instinct seems to have been the right one, you know, like long term, mm-hmm. if you want to keep something long term, like and, and the sanctity of it. I don't know. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, I, I, I mean, I interrupted you. I, I think, um, yeah, they just they got too big, I think. Um, I just I, I remember feeling that it's at a certain point. And yeah, it's it's not like anything to do with the people. Actually, I, I like a, a lot of the people who were, who were there. I don't know about now. It's it's a very different company now. Um, 
I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, Bernie left. I remember when Bernie left, I was like, ah, all right. But I think they were like at, they were at where they should have been, I think, around 2013, 20, may, maybe 2014 was like, was like around the time where I felt like it was, they still had like a big space and they were still like, but, but it felt like, it felt like it made sense to me. Like the scale that they were operating on, their let's plays were like very kind of, they felt like kind of homebrew. It was all in one room and it was like an office kind of, it, it just seemed more reasonable. And then, it started to kind of get to like, oh, they started having videos where it's like, okay, here's this big studio. Uh, here's this giant building. And I'm like, I don't know. How many, how many people did you hire? You, should, you, probably, should, you probably don't need like as many people as you've hired, I think. Um, These are, but it, yeah. it's wild. It's wild seeing all that stuff because like some of my favorite, like I mean, Ray and, and Michael and, and Gavin and those people. Like I, I remember I, the Rooster podcast is the first podcast that I listened to. I remember specifically because I remember feeling like oh this is like this is actually like sitting and almost like engaging with like a group of friends who are genuinely having a, a fun time talking to each other and that's kind of like the vibe that i wanted the snark tank to be too it's kind of like the, the the model in some way but yeah man they they it just i remember i checked it i checked back recently and i'm like i don't know any of these people now <laughs> i don't know who the fuck is on this show yeah like i just um, no i just like, i don't know like, man like it comes off to me like things like this ultimately come off to me more like vanity projects because mm -hmm. how can you run something for so long without making any money and not kind of craft it in such a way that it can be sustainable? I was I was in our discord talking about it. I'm like, there's so much interesting information in the variety piece, things I never knew about the company, right? They have 60,000 paying subscribers a month, paying an at like six dollars a month. This is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars a month in just subscriptions it's like dude if you had a lean 25 or 30 person company making great podcast products and all that and really focused in on on that sixty thousand people how could you not make money doing that how how is it even possible that you would not make money with sixty thousand people and then you realize well that's down 75 percent from their all-time high of having like two hundred and fifty thousand paying subscribers so that's interesting so the company is collapsing in some way but still you adjust and then you see the 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 headcount at, at the most they, they had 400 people. Dude, wow. what that's do you crazy. need yeah, that that's... many people for? Like and now they have a they or at the time of all these layoffs, it was a, it was down to 150. And it's like, I don't know what you think you're doing, but you're making video game content and you got to do it in a more lean way. And by the way, you can do it in a more lean way and pay people better, too. It's not like people at Rooster Teeth were making a lot of money. They, a lot of them weren't. Um, you know, we, unless you were like high level talent, from what I understand, it's like, we were making way more money and kind of funny than like a lot of the talent was there. So it wasn't like everyone was like, everyone was getting rich or something like that. I just, yeah. and then it kind of puts in the question, I brought this up in the past, but just the flippancy with money. Like I've said before that one of the strangest things that happened to me with at kind of funny with rooster teeth specifically, and the guys will remember this is. Like they randomly offered to just invest money into us. Like I think it was like one point four, one point five million dollars. It was going to be in like two payments or something of seven hundred and whatever thousand for no ownership. It wasn't about that. It was about to like make to like. As I remember it being delivered, it was like for you guys to grow, and like become the production company kind of of like that you envision. Not understanding that for me personally, I, I never envisioned that, and. It was a strange situation then. And I remember being, we were told I was against it. And it never happened. And I don't think I was the only one against it. I think that a lot of people were just like, we don't really need this. Like, why would we even, and, and by, it was to be clear, it was like, you pay it back through ad revenue and ad share and merch share and all that. So that would be paid back over time. And in high, and at the time I was like, I think that was 2015. That was weird. Yeah. But looking back at it, it's even more weird. Because now we know from the variety story that like for several years up to that point, they had made no money and they just look at everything as a growth opportunity. It's just so. It's such a strange point of view about small upstart media companies, like why do you want to mechanize them and corporatize them? It's like, oh, all you guys. Oh, you have this very successful fan funded thing. All you need is more money. It's like, no, I think we're OK. We're yeah. better than OK. And that was then. And so I just think 
I'm just glad I got away from that from a creative point of view, because, again, it's not a personal thing. Like Bernie was a really sweet guy. Like I said, Jeff, really sweet guy. They were all really nice. It's just that I think I'm not even sure it was really them. It was probably the people that they had sold to who then sold to Warner where it's like, no, this is a growth thing. Like we got to grow and make money. It's Rooster Teeth. We got to make. And I'm like, damn, dude, that's a misrepresent. That's a misunderstanding of the entire situation and how with something leaner and more focused they could have made a lot more people much richer over time instead of it just being, you know, good money after bad. And that's kind of the bummer of it. So obviously we care for the people that are laid off. Obviously, it's like the the death of a legendary brand, but it goes so much deeper than that, because to, to, to Kale's inquiry that we read earlier. It does say something about the mismanagement of media enterprises in this space, and we yeah. saw that with G4 as well. It's like, what universe? Was the G4 you envisioned coming back? What universe was that going to happen? <laughs> maybe then they, where they had over 200 people working there. It's like maybe for 20 people. Right. Mm, a show a day or something. You know, and people just don't know what they're doing. And I, I'm, I'm glad the people that founded Rooster Teeth got their money, which they did. Right. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. They, 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 they seemed like uh, even just from from the transparency of, of uh, some of their shows that they, they, those guys seemed like really chill people that I really respected. But yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think, I think there's like this attitude of uh, bloat is better than lean. That is kind of infecting a lot of things. Um, I don't even think it's necessarily like a recent thing. I think it's been happening for a while, but I think it's probably like the poisoning of just what business has become where it's like, everything needs to be a growth opportunity. Everything needs to grow, 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 grow. Um, Oh, we made we made two billion dollars this year, uh, but we made uh, one point five billion dollars this year. So like uh, that, the, the 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 two billion doesn't count anymore because we've gone down. Uh, it's, it's like just just make your money and be lean. And I, I don't I don't got, there's like such a self-sabotaging nature about it. Like, I don't I don't get it. Why you can't just like let your good thing be the good thing. Why does it have to evolve? Be yeah. like, be like, yeah. be like Ash Ketchum and understand mm. that he doesn't need a Raichu. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't know, man. I, I'm so fascinated in the business part of the industry and I just, I'm so tired of seeing bad decisions made with mm, yeah. over, over years with just one time sustainable, one time interesting products. Some, everything dies. This will die. The show and this brand will die one day, just like Rooster Teeth has gone away and just like many other brands that we once thought wouldn't go away. But hopefully it's not from bad decision making. I can accept atrophy. Like an age and time passing. That's just the way it goes. That 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 comes for everyone. There are things that we'll never think of again. And maybe this will be one of those things in 100 years. This podcast, certainly it probably will be, you know? Yeah, I, I can accept that. I just don't want to put things in the early graves when they didn't need to be there. That happens way too often. There are some shambling corpses that should already be in their grave, but more often than not, I find that you find some interesting brands going away from just not understanding what time it is. And that's, that's a shame because that's, that's unnatural. That's like a self-forced injury right? that didn't need to exist. Rooster, so if Rooster Teeth was just handled by better arbiters, it wouldn't have come to this. There's just no way it could have. How could it have come to this? Man, oh man. How does a company let an entity run in the red for 10 plus years? <laughs> How is that even possible? Where did the money come from? My God. If you're I running in the know. red that long... Man, they must have fucking when they when full screen bought them and then they just started losing money. They must have been freaking out. And it, w what was even more interesting was just how hard headed a lot of their decision making was like finding out from the variety piece that they never made money on RTX. It was always losing money. It's like, why did you keep doing it? Why did you keep doing these things? You know, let's play live and all of these things. How did how are you not making money from that? But we're making money from fucking 500 person shows in New York City. How is that possible? Unless you are so over leveraged in some way, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's that overhead, man. It's, it's yeah. like, hey, we, we got we got to have we got to have this giant 
We got to have 50,000 acres of, of, of buildings so that we can record Let's Plays on them. And it comes off as a, like a form of like forced legitimization. It's like we're only legitimate when we reach this point. We're only legitimate when we have a studio. We're only legitimate when we have this. We're only legitimate when we have a parent Convention. company. It's like, give me a break, yeah. dude. If, yeah, that's like the, if that's the definition of legitimacy, I never want that because I'm just happy making our money and doing our thing and doing well and not needing more than what I have. I'm good. I really am. You know, like <sighs> this mentality of, like you said, of constant growth is, is kind of despicable. Yeah. But it is what it is. RIP, rooster teeth. Yeah. RIP in peace. It's a good thing we don't have to worry about that uh, mentality of constant growth in the gaming industry. Am I right, fellas? I know. Well said. <laughs> All right, let's get into what we're playing. It says here, Chris, you are still hell diving. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, I haven't uh, play, played much. I played a little bit of Helldiver. It's it's kind of my go-to game right now just because my friends are on super late and it's like, hey, yeah, I'll get on a game or two. I don't know what it is lately, Colin, but maybe maybe it's this like, Maybe it's just melancholy that you're talking mm. about. But like, I don't I'm not in the mood to play anything, which sucks because there are games that I want to play. But then I sit and I just like I don't actively like have the drive to do it. I don't know what's going on because I'm not depressed. I know that because I've been depressed. And I'm not depressed. So I don't know what the fuck's going on. I think I'm just like in this weird like Zen space right now mm. where mm. nothing's really grabbing my eye to the degree that it's motivating me to jump in. Interesting. I, I hope that. I hope that subsides soon because I've definitely felt this in periods of time throughout my life. Uh, sometimes it's like a long period. Sometimes it's like very quick. But I, it's the first time that I've been, I've caught it like as it's happening. It's like, oh, yeah, it's happening right now. Strange. Hmm. Mm. So I don't know. Maybe I'll jump into Bellatro. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Go support some those weird, guys. Some weird thing to maybe uh, cleanse my palate or something. But Yeah. It's really just Helldivers. I'm really, I'm really excited about this this mech stuff that's happening, or or, or the 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 way the way that they're rolling that stuff out. I think is really, really cute and interesting. How they're like, oh, mechs are the 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 planet that makes the mechs are is under siege. Go liberate it or whatever. It's like yeah. this is cool. Elliot Wilson wrote a post about this. Oh, this did he? All right, lads. Oh yeah. Maybe. Right. Um, well, uh, what'd you say? Sorry. No, no, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. You may be sick of talking about it, but I'm not sick of hearing about it. Helldivers 2. I just wanted to commend the devs on tying their updates to in-game lore. Recently, we have found out that the mechs and vehicles are being added to the game, and the official announcement was along the lines of mechs are being built on Planet X and will be deployed soon. With the recent news that this patch may be delayed a little, they said the factory is under attack by automatons and production yeah. is halted. They're small, but details like this are cool and help make delays almost fun. It'd be interesting to see this in other games. Yeah, so to what you're saying, thanks, yes. Elliot, for writing in. Yeah, I, I like that, too. It seems like their whole... And I don't know how if online games often replicate this, but the their entire idea of having like a live dynamic game master that is just manipulating the game um, in different yeah. ways is pretty cool. And to bake it into the story where the automatons take the planet over. So like some mechs were showing up and now they're all they all stop. I think it's neat. They've just been dropping in vehicles and things are just showing up like armored personnel carriers. And yeah, it's pretty neat. And it's a good way to like live test things and get people excited and amped up and share footage and. By the way, yeah. the game has also gone up in sales week over week over week, apparently. So it's one of the very rare games that is not decaying over time. Yeah, yeah, it, it's they've really got a good thing here. And I think um, I think they've got a clever way of of maneuvering through this live service space. I think they're doing it really, really well. Like you said, like it just like the dynamic dropping of or, or the dynamic teasing of certain things. Like I remember uh, Dustin sent me that this video of a. Uh, the buggy or like the um the jeep yeah. like actively in game and it's like this is cool this is a cool way to tease things it gets people actively talking there's like a it's almost like there's almost like an arg aspect element to it um from back in the day when they would be like oh you'd have to go to the go to this payphone at this time to get like a code to put into the website and then you'll get like a trailer or something it's like it feels cool um so props to them still. I'm, I, I won't mention Helldivers again in like what I'm playing in because it's probably going to be like it, it's going to be like Destiny, I think, for me in one of those th it, it, or one of those games where it's it's you're, you're just safe to assume <laughs> that I'm probably playing it. Uh, and I don't know if I'll have much else to say about it. It's it is ultimately like you said, Colin, the same. It, it is the same thing every time, but I'm still really enjoying it. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to check out some of these updates and how that how these balance changes fuck with it I, I didn't notice it when i was playing but 
I'm a little bit stubborn with that stuff. I've still been, I have not used a shotgun for a while because I just kind of don't like the way it feels. I, I like blasting automatic weapons. So I, I've stuck with like the, what is it? The, the first, what is it? The, um, oh my God. The, one, of the, one of the heavier versions of the, the, the normal like machine gun that you get at, at the beginning. Yeah, I don't even know. I don't know any of the names of the, the guns off the top yeah, of my head. I haven't really unlocked I all of the core ones yet. And then you get the special currency to go and buy the the second tier of weapons, I guess. And then there's going to be like yeah. a third tier as well. I do find that the unlocks are not that tantalizing. I do have this really dope armor that I think I like randomly got access to that like no one seems to have. You know how they just have the random things for sale mm-hmm. using the in-game currency? And I never bought currency. I just you get the currency for exchanging your medals. So I bought this super cool blue armor that I love, but it doesn't give me any statistical boosts or anything like that. So yeah. it gets a little, it's fun. I just, it, I am kind of, I need to give it a little distance now because it's I'm like, it yeah, is just really the same thing over and over again. And I don't knowing now about this meta stuff and all that's like, I don't want to play at these high levels and, have, and be annoyed and be like, again, the best reference I can think of is like sitting at a serious blackjack table and like pulling the wrong card and everyone gets mad at you and like you ruin the whole game and quotes <laughs> and stuff. And, it's like, that's not fun to me. This is the exact illustration of why I don't want to play games online. So I think I'm like right on that line and I just got to stay there. Right. All right. Dustin, let's go to you. It says you're playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's finally here and I've been playing quite a bit and I'm having a fantastic time. I know that a lot of the audience is playing now, so I, I'm going to be as light not not light not even light on spoilers just surface level so don't worry but the thing that is striking me right now is that how the story is obviously very serious it's uh you know in the first game in in remake it's a very uh crazy situation that the uh the characters are in you know dealing with shinra and and the planet and stuff like that but what i'm finding in rebirth is it is in a lot of ways feels like this really fun, lighthearted adventure that I'm really, really into. The thing that is surprising me the most is that this game is genuinely very funny. I have laughed out loud multiple times playing this game. And usually in games like this, when something's funny, it's just kind of you, you do like the, the no laugh laugh. You're like, huh? You know, something yeah. like that. But I've like legitimately there's been many moments where Cloud will say something or something like that. And it's uh it's been very funny. So I'm I'm really impressed on how they've been able to expand the combat system in particular. Um there's like really cool duo moves that you can do with other party members. Um and the open world aspects also pretty impressive. But I want to make sure I know, Colin, you haven't played yet. And so I don't want to, that will get to spoil you on anything. The number one question though I want to answer that people are asking me is, am I playing on graphics mode or am I playing on performance mode? I am playing on performance mode. And it is, I don't want to say it's tough, but it is downgraded pretty severely. Not to the point where it. I've gotten used to it. We're to the point now when I sit down to play, I don't even notice it. I I mentioned this on Summon Sign that the night that it came out was the night before my new couch came. So I had a I like pushed my love seat into the middle of the, the room. So I was much, <laughs> much closer to my 65 inch TV than normal. I was like, oh, no, this looks this is the the softness of this image is pretty bad. And uh, so I was pretty concerned, like I was going to feel really like I was missing out on the the fidelity of what it could look like if I didn't play in 30 FPS. But when I was sitting at my normal distance from the TV, so I had a little more distance between me and actually seeing the screen, I could still tell it's soft, but because I'm not as close, it's not as bad. So I know that they said they're going to do a patch to improve things. Normally, I'm pretty skeptical of patches that they say oh we're gonna make the graphics better because usually they're not quite the big save that you might think they might be but i'm okay with it overall in that i think it will be jarring for some people and i think colin for you what's what's going to happen is you're going to play remake and then go directly to rebirth 
and think, oh, uh, how do, why does this game not look as good as the previous game that came out on the previous generation? But when you see the openness of the world, you understand where the trade-off is. And it's not that it's horrendous, but it is definitely a little bit of a downgrade. But overall, I'm having such a good time. It's been a conflict for me where I don't know if I want to do side stuff or I want to do the story because the story parts have been so good the way that they've kept faithful to the original and changed things much like the last game uh, where a lot of the changes so far have been. I'm not saying like crazy story changes, just like different ways that they've adapted things have been really, really solid. So. I'm having a fantastic time. I can't wait to play more. I'm going to play it probably as soon as we're done recording. And it's taken over my life. So hope you guys are enjoying it too. Excellent. Yeah, I won't get to it for a while. I'm um, I'm playing the re- remake. I was experiencing a similar thing, as I said earlier, a, a melancholy where I don't really play video games when I'm... I don't play music or anything either when I'm just not feeling right. I can't really do much of anything. I can't even really enjoy a television show or something more passive or a book. So I I found that I I had like a whole week plus of just wasted time because I just wasn't in it. And then I was a little too sick to even think about it. And then I wasn't really into it after that, I should say. So I'm a little bit behind on where I need to be. And I wanted to say something really earnest to the audience about how grateful I am that we get to do this for a living and the the variety we get to uh, the, the, the variety in which we get to do this for a living. So what I mean by that is I was seeing in our discord because Maddie and cog and other people that we know still get early access to a bunch of games. So, um, and you know, they do their other projects, whether it's iron Lords or Maddie's YouTube channel or whatever. So they have all these different reasons to kind of, to kind of solicit these games. And I don't, I, 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 we've never asked them to do one things one way or the other. So I don't really care about that at all. Um, but I had kind of gotten word from people in the know that, Oh, it's like, um, rise of the ronin codes are out now and here's the embargo and this is this and this is that and i'm like jesus christ man and i had this flashback to my time in media where i would just be so overwhelmed because you feel like often i would have to review a lot of these games but you also you just feel like you have to play and have to touch all these different games and i'm thinking about my position where from my point of view where I'm like I barely have I'm on chapter seven I think in Final Fantasy seven remake my my second playthrough I'm not going to get to rebirth probably in any more than a couple of weeks then rise of the Ronins out there which might be interesting I still really re- want to play Pacific Drive I want to check out this Bellatro game there's all this all this other stuff and I came to a peaceful conclusion inside where I was like it doesn't matter like I don't there's no rush the audience doesn't demand this out of you you can kind of play things at your own pace and enjoy them and take time for yourself and all the rest and so i'm like really grateful that we're not against that grind because if i were in the old world i would have gotten the rise of the ronin code i still wouldn't be on rebirth i still would have all this stuff to do with remake i would feel all this crushing pressure probably be canceling plans and doing all this to like catch up and i just don't have to do it and i'm just grateful for that you know losing access is a thing you have to get used to because you're so used to getting everything you want. And that's true. I got anything I wanted early, like for many years. And once you let go of that and play like normal people play again, you realize that the only way to keep up with games behind the scenes these days is to completely commoditize them to the point of being sheer products that you have to hit an embargo for. And that's it. Like, it's amazing to me that people now by nature have to be over rebirth and get into Rise of the Ronin on the PlayStation side. It's yeah. like, damn, dude, I'm not even like, <laughs> I haven't even begun to thought about, think about it yet. And much of the audience hasn't even gotten to play it yet. It's just crazy. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Like that's, I'm a free, I'm really grateful for that. Appreciative of that where you can, I kind of do have my cake and eat it too in this regard. And yeah. it's, it's awesome. I know some people get upset that I don't play games more quickly, but that's not a common thread in our audience at all. They don't care. I think yeah. some inside has done a lot a, to alleviate that as well. Go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, we have such a, a wide array of hosts now and shows that sure we're not going to cover everything like i don't i think the only person that's played that that card game is ben <laughs> um so i don't know if that's been covered at all but for the most part someone's going to cover one of the big releases on some show so we have a, a nice little array and, and crew here to to kind of pick up the slack where if you're not playing something big or one of us isn't then someone else will 
a couple of notes about games as well is that I do want to do, as I said earlier, a Helldivers 2 episode of Sacred Plus. That might be this coming week. Maybe we'll do that. Um, Dagan and I are going to cover Final Fantasy VII Remake on Knockback. Probably not the next episode, but the episode after that. And I think that there'll be deeper coverage of Rebirth on Summon Sign, although we'll do an episode for it if we have to, um, dedicated to it whenever I get around to it. So everyone keep your notes. I've been taking very extensive notes as I played through Final Fantasy VII Remake. I, we already did an episode about it a long time ago, but I'm just taking very fastidious notes. It's it's interesting. So just about my playthrough real quick before we move on. I'm in Chapter 7. There's 18 chapters, so you know I'm about like a third of the way through or so. And the game is so captivating. It's very weird in how into it I am, considering its tropiness and some of its weird delivery and characterizations. But I kind of dig it. If you can dig it for what it is, I think it's like really, really good. And there are some really poignant, like I love the moment, the chapter with Jesse leaving and going to her mom's house, right? Like that's a... yeah. And one of the things that I just know, and this is one of the things that I kind of have more explicitly discussed. I actually, we actually circulated a, um, a post about it on social media that a lot of people picked up and that I've kind of been more gently trying to tell people to play final, the original Final Fantasy VII before Final Fantasy VII Remake because they're fundamentally different games that both technically happen in some sense in the timeline. And it's amazing how much is different in this one. And how like a lot of people, st- I was trying to read about it. Like, what are the, what are the, cha- the major changes that people identify? And it's like, damn, like a lot of people aren't writing about this, 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 and this, like these obvious thematic changes or additions or whatever that make the game fundamentally different. And it's just really good. I'm really excited to get to Rebirth and I, I, I'm excited to see where Rebirth ends and where, where everything stands. Because at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake, it's very it different than where Final Fantasy 7 was at that time in a lot of different ways. And so will it fundamentally be the same thing for this one now where we'll look kind of at the last third of the game from a very different view. Very exciting, you know. So I'm glad people seem to really be enjoying it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be patient and get to it when I get to it. All right, my friends, let's get into the news items, some bigger news items I wanted to discuss this week. There's not too much going on, actually, but some big news, especially on the PC front. So let's get into it. Number one. The long persistent rumors are true. Ghost of Tsushima is coming to PC and it's doing so fairly quickly. It'll be available on May 16th. The original game, of course, comes by way of Sony owned team Sucker Punch, and it was launched as essentially PlayStation 4's final exclusive of consequence in the summer of 2020. Sales haven't been announced since 2022, and it surpassed 10 million copies sold on PS4 and PS5. Indeed, the game received a native PS5 port in 2021. While Sucker Punch toils away on a sequel, which is apparently set to be revealed later this year, Another Sony-owned team, the, P- the PC port house Nixes, is responsible for bringing Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut to PC, and it'll mark their fifth port since being purchased. They also ported three Insomniac games to PC in the form of Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Ratchet and Clank Re- Rift, the- I'm sorry, Rift Apart, and they are also responsible for the incoming PC port of Gorilla's Horizon Forbidden West, which we discussed earlier in this episode. As the name suggests, the Director's Cut includes the core game, as well as the Iki Island expansion from 2021, and perhaps most importantly for some, its multiplayer Legends mode. Ghost of Tsushima on PC will support 21.9, 32.9, and 48.9 resolutions, meaning you can use up to three monitors. And quote, NVIDIA DLSS3 and AMD FSR3 are available with both upscaling and frame generation options. You're going to have to help me with pronunciation here. Intel XCSS, or is that Zess? I think it is XCSS, but I don't know as much about that, uh, that brand. So Upscaling is also supported. And if your hardware has headroom to spare... You can use NVIDIA DLAA or FSR3 native AA, or is that AA, to boost further image quality, end quote. You can pre-order the game beginning now on Steam and Epic Game Store, and we'll get some in-game perks for doing so. The price is $59.99. All right, Ghost of Tsushima incoming. <clears throat> what are our thoughts? More contentious. If you go read the PlayStation blog post, for instance, people are whining about this in the comments there. And so on and so forth. Really? I do wonder what you think of Ghost of Tsushima coming to PC on what is it, May twenty? No, May sixteenth. What is there to whine about? Just oh my, my exclusives. Is that like what it that is? Or? Yeah, that is what it is. I mean, oh is man, man, that's crazy. How is that possible? Still? So <laughs> annoying. <laughs> that blows uh, my mind. I gotta say, I have been thinking about this game, and I think it's just because I've been thinking about what its sequel will be like 
And I'm curious about a, a PC port. I'm imagining what it could be like to play on the super high settings at 120 frames per second. And in particular, I've started to get really curious about ultra wide monitors, which I don't need a new monitor. I have a LG OLED, the 48 inch, which is huge as my computer monitor to play games. But I'm always curious about ultra wide because it seems like it would be pretty immersive and, and cool. So I got to say, though, uh, Nix is pretty, pretty powerhouse team here to be doing all these ports, doing a lot of good stuff. And uh, I like that they're going above and beyond to incorporate PC technology as far as DLSS, FSR3, you know, even the Intel stuff that I don't know as much about that isn't really as popular to my understanding is uh, also included. So they're not just bare bones PC ports. They're full fledged and provide all these features that PC gamers want. So shout out to them. Interesting note here. I wanted to look this up to make sure I got this right. Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut on PC will be $59.99. You can buy it right now for $69.99 on PS5, which is a little strange. It'll be a $10 upgrade if you already own it um, hmm. on PS4. So I'm not, not crazy about the pricing, but um, what are you thinking here, Chris? PC version, are you going to check this out, Ghost of Tsushima? You, you were both more hot on this game than I was. I mean, I like it. I think it's great, but I wasn't yeah. blown away by it by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I I just felt there there was something there that was just very masterful and like I, specifically in the specifically open world design and 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 the way that that game grabs your attention and and directs you towards certain things. I like I like the diegetic use of waypoints in that game. I think it's very clever. I think it's really I think it's really smart. I think that game is artistically very gorgeous for a game that you know. Uh, we tend to look at we tend to look at video games that are based in realism, I guess, like from a fidelity standpoint or from like a graphics or art style perspective as as being, you know, somewhat generic. And I think Ghost of Tsushima for for being r- rooted in an art style like that, where it's it's just it's ultimately just real people in a real place is still so stylized. And I remember just being very, very impressed with that. And. And even just some of the themes I remember really liking. So I, I think PC players are going to have a, a really fun, a really great game on their hands with this. And I think I might actually jump into this because I never actually jumped into um, Iki Island, uh, which I believe is is in the director's cut, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty I sure. I never did either. So, yeah, no, it is. Um, it is. So, uh, I, will, <clears throat> I will do the same on PS5. I'll play the whole game again on PS5 when the new one comes out. Yeah. yeah. The Iki Island, it'll be way better if you're already playing the game and not going yeah. back to it because it's definitely harder. Well, I right? recall thinking it was insanely hard and mm. it was because I hadn't played the game for months and months and months. And so I barely know how to play anymore. And then was diving into this DLC. So you'll have a way better time yeah. than I did. Cause I, I ended up dropping it just, and it wasn't any fault of the game. It just, I had a skill issue. Yeah. Quite literally. No, I, I mean, yeah, I'm yeah, I, I just really, I liked it. I feel, I feel like it was one of those games that um, was doing just, really interesting things and really clever things with art and design and world building and, and world um, world design. And also just from a selfish perspective, I was like, this is the Assassin's Creed game that I wanted for a really, really long time. Low key, like just this Japanese um, kind of, Oh, you're a, you're kind of a, you're kind of a ninja, but you're also a samurai. It was cool. And all, I remember thinking the stance system was neat and, just the the hot springs and even just the the little gimmicky stuff with like the the haikus i don't know that it was it was a really it was, a, it was just a really good time that game uh and yeah i'm I'm stoked to see it come to bc i i think i will check this out actually the more i think the more i think about it and the more i remember it the more i realize that like i really like that game but i also remember very little like narratively about it or like encounter base so like it, it might be a good time to be like yeah yeah i'll by the time this game comes out, certainly on PS on PC, I'll I'll have had even more of it kind of washed from my memory by the passage of time. So it'll be nice to go back into it. <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima comes to PC May sixteenth. To your point, Dustin Benjar wrote in and said, "Hey, gents, just want to shout out Nix's software for their consistent PC port releases. One of the best acquisitions from their acquisition spree in the last three years, in my opinion. We saw how devs can fuck up these ports, like The Last of Us Part One, and so far, Nix is always delivers. Yeah, this is a brilliant." a brilliant purchase. I, I said that at the time and 
it's just it's strange if you go read the PlayStation blog post. I mean, not that it's in, in, you know, necessarily indicating indicative rather of a general feeling, but someone literally says Nix's has been like the worst purchase for Sony. That's crazy. And I'm like, Nix's is printing free money for Sony and is doing it very effectively on a platform where growth is necessary for PlayStation to ultimately survive as it is currently constituted. I know I'm not speaking to most of the audience because I know most of the audience is on board with it, but Mm -hmm. this idea that Sony shouldn't embrace PC as a platform is totally insane. And they need to figure out ways to do it that don't alienate and isolate PS5 customers as being fundamentally the most important customer to the PlayStation brand because they are. But selling Ghost of Tsushima four years after it came out? Come on, man. It's done what it's going to do. And I think that these dates should get closer and they're going to get closer and closer, you know, um, for sure. Like, there's just no doubt. Like, there's no reason to even wait. When we know how sales trajectories typically go and that you've kind of by this ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th week, you're done. It's over. So why not say like after six months or I would say day and date with some, well, we're going to get it with the multiplayer games, but day and date with some of these games and just see how it does. I'd be very curious to, to see how that experiment goes. People need to understand that though Hell Divers 2 is doing extraordinarily well on PS5, it's doing be- even better on PC. Mm-hmm. So why would you just cut that audience out? They're also going to be the ones that sustain it, help sustain it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't I, get the anti PC stuff. I just don't get it. I don't think they're thinking from a sustainability standpoint. I think they're thinking of it from like a selfish perspective where it's like, I want this and I don't want anybody else to have it. But like you said, that's not, it really is. I do think it is that simple. I, I don't think, um, I don't think the majority of our listeners are even, I, I would be surprised if even a, even a noticeable fraction of our audience thought that way. But, um, yeah, I, 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 it's the idea that Nixus is their worst purchase when Bungie exists is crazy. And I don't mean that. From, <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean that from, and I'd say that as somebody who loves Bungie, like that, that company's great. I love it and, and their output, but um, especially over the last couple the last, like pretty much my entire life. But like, I mean, the, the deal on Nixus and their output versus the Bungie purchase is insane. That's objectively, that's almost, ob- that's objectively measurable. Yeah. So far, unless they really turn things around at Bungie, I'm, I'm always going to be kind of negative on that. Maybe, maybe Marathon will end up being huge and they'll make all their money back and all that. But I, I just, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see even closer to with the, the final shape and all the rest, how people take to that in oh, yeah. June. Mm-hmm. And about, let me see here before I move on. Yeah, I, the, the PC stuff. See, the honest truth is that I do understand from a fan perspective like i don't personally feel this way but i understand more why a nintendo fan or a playstation fan or an xbox fan would be like i don't want my games and quotes going to this other console but pc is like this agnostic place where you aren't really going to capture a lot of these people on console it's just different it's totally everyone's putting their well nintendo isn't but others are putting their games there now sony putting their games on other platforms it's like i really couldn't give a fuck less if they did that i just don't think it makes any sense for them to do that i mean from an analysis standpoint it's like why would they ever put their games on xbox that makes no sense but beyond that it doesn't really affect me so it's, yeah. and it doesn't really affect you either all right number two here on sacred symbols we try to celebrate games from around the world especially those that come from more off the beaten path locales when it comes to our industry Why? Because good games can no doubt be found in all sorts of mysterious places, and Sony has led the charge on this front by identifying and helping fund games from locations like China and Africa. As listeners know, Sony's multi-round China Hero Project, for instance, helped bring Chinese games to market like Fist, Forge, and Shadow Torch, Anno Mutatinium, I can never even say that word, and In Nightmare, and so on. And the company recently announced investments in Africa through Carry First, the continent's biggest game publisher. And as we discussed first about a year ago, Sony was eyeing India next. And now we have a list of games Sony is looking to help extract from that market for global audiences. Come, um, the games are as follows. From Big Boot Games comes Meteora, the race against space time. Coming to PS5, PSVR 2, and PC, it's described as, quote, an arcade combat racer, end quote, where you play as a meteor, quote, cascading your way through a volatile universe of awe and wonder as you outmaneuver, pursue, and obliterate rival meteors in a dazzling display of strategy and skill, end quote. This game looks a little bit like Super Stardust, but I don't think it's going to be quite like that. Uh, let's see here. Next is a game called Fishbowl from developer I Miss My Friends. 
Coming to PS5 and PC, quote, Fishbowl is a slice of life story that takes players on a journey of nostalgia and melancholy, exploring themes of grief, connection and self-discovery set in the cultural landscape of urban India, end quote. It's a pixel art game. Really pretty. Third up is a game called Mutki by a team called Underdogs Studio. Quote, Mutki is a first person story exploration game set within the immersive environment of an Indian museum, delving deep into a critical social issue, human trafficking, human trafficking, end quote. So as you explore the museum in the game, you get more and more of this story about this human trafficking that's happening, I think, on the premises or something. Mutki will come to PS5 and PC. Fourth up is perhaps the most interesting game for my taste, a 2D side scrolling action platformer named Requital Gates of Blood from developer Holy Cow Productions. It'll come to PS5 and PC and, quote, is inspired by Egyptian mythology set in the mystical underworld of Duat. Players assume the role of Zara, traversing the afterlife to defeat the mighty guardians of the Gates of Duat, end quote. It's uh, apparently a, some sort of maybe even boss rush style game. The fifth and final game for now, anyways, is developer Kathasami's Suri, The Seventh Note, a PS5 and PC, quote, 2D action exploration game set in the enchanting backdrop of mythical India. When, uh, end quote, when all these games are slated to release is unknown, but it's unlikely we'll see any of them this calendar year. So shout out to our Indian friends. Yeah getting their games on PlayStation, getting noticed. I think it's great that Sony does this. I'd be interested. I know there'll be more rounds of the India Hero Project, just like there were with China's Hero Project. So we'll get more games out of there. But getting involved in these emerging markets is just great for business, but it's also just great to extract what could be the next big thing. And these are such minor investments in, frankly, in a, a developing economy where it doesn't cost very much to live. So it's not like you're, if you're investing $4 million or something in a game, it's going to go a long way there. So do check it out. These can all be seen on PlayStation blog, by the way. All right. Yeah. Uh, oh, the one with the sun. Now say? that, now yeah. that Sony's involved, uh, the one where you play as a meteor, uh, maybe they'll add in a hard hitting story about him trying to be a father. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. in the sequel. So all it needs, <laughs> I, I watched father the trailer Project. for the, that one Mutki, the one the, that takes place in museum, but kind of cool. It is, yeah. uh, had very, creepy liminal space vibes because you're going around this empty museum with a flashlight looks a little spooky but yeah it's a neat neat project overall i'm curious to see how these games turn out number three we wouldn't usually dedicate a written out news item to an announcement like this but it's actually fairly important for the first time ever the complete stalker series of shooters will be playable on console and yes they're coming to playstation particularly to ps4 Indeed, you can download all three games individually or as a package right this very second. Originally leaked out of Japan before it was properly announced at an Xbox third party event, the Stalker collection is called Stalker Legends of Zone Tr of the Zone Trilogy. It includes Shadow of Chernobyl, Clear Sky, and Call of Pripyat, and all three will make a nice prelude to Stalker 2, Heart of Chernobyl, the all-new Stalker game that's slated for launch on Xbox and PC later this year as a three-month exclusive before it comes to PlayStation 5. Now some backstory, especially relevant considering the recent state of geopolitics. Stalker's home studio is called GSC Game World, and they're one of the very few Ukrainian console development teams to ever exist. Indeed, the upcoming Stalker game was primarily made in Ukraine, though the team moved elsewhere in Eastern Europe after Russia's 2022 invasion of the country. Though a, uh, though a studio going back to, um, to the mid-90s, I'm sorry, and known primarily for a more obscure series of PC games called Cossacks, it wasn't until 2007 that the team broke through the mainstream with Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, launched a PC that year by now-defunct publisher THQ. The FPS was well received and was followed up by two more Stalker games locked to PC, 2008's Clear Sky and 2007's, 2010's Call of Pripyat. As for Stalker 2, it has been development forever. It was actually first announced in 2010, but the version we're going to get later this year was itself begun around 2018. I was amped to see this because these are games that are missing for me. Yeah. Um, very similar to, I remember these, we had a big PC gaming editorial unit at IGN when I was there early on and they they would always play these PC games like crisis that we would never or we got, ended up getting crisis later but games that were very much locked to PC and this was one of those and I was always fascinated by this and always annoyed that they never migrated over to console it didn't really make any sense to me especially at that time so I'm amped about this they're already out you can buy them individually or as a set as I noted and uh, are, are you guys familiar with stalker do you have any interest in checking them out they're Ukrainian games too and that's kind of cool at a time like this Play a little something from Ukraine. Yeah, I I remember I remember kind of having this strange relationship with Stalker where like I always wanted to check it out, but I was intimidated by it for some reason. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if I don't think I ever engaged with anybody who 
told me that it was like this hardcore thing or like it, nothing. It just has this vibe or this air about it that that this is something to approach seriously. And I was just like, I don't know if I can. Uh, I don't know if I have it in me. And I was, it was always easy for me to do it, too, because it was just like, ah, well, it's not on console. So I guess I could just pretend like it's not there. But now that it's there and it's going to be staring me in the face, I guess, <laughs> in my living room every time I log on to these machines, I, it's calling me a little bit. Like, there, there is something about it that is alluring. And I do think it does have to do with the fact that it is this Ukrainian game, this, this kind of... I think it's what attracted me to Metro as well. Like, this, just this, this different perspective i guess on what these games could be or or, or like i don't even know what kind of game it is all i know is that it's an fps and that there's some it's I, like a horror that, fps i think yeah you know. i i've heard that it's like a like fallout adjacent but that's not exactly accurate but so, so i i don't know i i think i i want to jump into these but i kind of want to jump into them as blind as possible because i kind of like that i i have very very little context for what stalker even is and so the fact that they're available, yeah. I, I don't know which. I don't know if they're like narrative based, or if there's like a like a story that goes from one to the next, or if it's like a, if they're each different stories entirely. But I, ideally, I would. I feel like I would want to play the most recent one. Yeah, some of the trophies are bugged apparently, which is a bummer. Um, hmm. So definitely look into those if you care about all of that. But yeah, I think Shadow Chernobyl is like the is the main one. I think Clear Sky was like a. 1.5 version and i think the uh, pripyat one was like the sequel and then they yeah. they moved on to i think a, Co- a cossacks game and then they have been making this fucking game that's coming out later this year the the what is looked at as stalker 2 proper right as uh you know and that will be on game pass for three months so i think it comes to game pass in september we might get it as soon as december on on ps5 but we'll we'll wait and see uh dustin do you have any interest in stalker before we move on I don't know much about this series. I know our our very own Lockmort is really into these and very excited for the sequel. But they love their Euro watching, jank over there, don't they? they oh really yeah, do. oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> watching the the trailer that came from that Xbox event, it I felt like light nostalgia for a game I've never played or seen before because it looks very much of that right. time FPS. And so I'm I'm mainly curious in that I know a little bit about the metro games and i played uh exodus specifically so i don't know they're they feel very much in the same camp to me but i don't really know what the difference is so i might have to check this out at some point but i don't know i might be a purist and play these on on pc and check that out there but i'm glad it's available for consoles it just makes sense get these out for you know before the sequel all right i have a fourth item I didn't have a chance to write it up, but it broke right before we started recording. Marvel Spider-Man 2, new game plus, new suits, all out now as part of version 1.002. James Stevenson, personal friend of mine, great guy. Glad to, that he is still okay after the layoffs over there. I was talking to him a little bit after all that went down. He writes on a PlayStation blog, quote, a quick update. We're pleased to announce that as of this morning, two game updates have been deployed for Marvel Spider-Man 2 to enable the features d- detailed below in this blog. If you are playing version 1.002, you have them both. These updates include New Game Plus, Mission Replay, the ability to change time of day, and brand new accessibility features like screen reader, audio descriptions, and more. We also added Hellfire Gala suits for Peter and Miles, both of which are free for all players. And we added the ability to purchase the GameHeads Fine Fresh Suit Pack, which benefits GameHeads. GameHeads apparently is like some sort of um, like charity that you can read about. It says, uh, we develop and talent, we develop diverse talent and bold new voices in gaming, train students for the tech ecosystem and prepare them for college, career, and civic life. We serve low-income students and underrepresented students ages 15 through 25 in 15 different states with expansions to Honolulu and Atlanta. So I guess they're partnering with Insomniac. So these are available. These are free if you want to check them out. Um, and you can purchase the Game Heads ones, obviously, for a charity. Uh, are you guys going to go back to Spider-Man 2? There are trophies associated with this. I don't know if they're live yet let me take a look but there yeah here they are there is a new game plus trophy the silver oh that's the only addition that's nice i'm not going back anytime soon i mean i what i in the discord last night in our staff chat i was like i'm not pl- i just got to the beach in rebirth okay i'm not playing anything else <laughs> i'll right play now. this when spider-man 3 comes out right exactly that that's yeah when i'll need to be reminded time. of everything that has happened 
in Spider-Man because I don't remember already. Yeah, it, it is. I, I, I will say it's nice that they finally added the the tendril color swap. I, that was always so distracting because I, I liked using the black suit. And then after after you beat the story and then so seeing the white anti-venom symbiote tendrils come out of the black suit like really it's such a dumb little complaint but it bothered the hell out of me so it's nice to see that that's gone so i won't have to deal with that when i come back to it before spider-man 3 comes out Excellent. really slight little feature that i appreciate spider-man spider-man 2 just writing notes 2 million or uh, 10 million sold not so not so shabby no for insomniac all right Let's get into listener inquiries. It's time to end our show. We always do with uh, six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. There's just not that much to talk about this week. It's kind of a nice, slow week. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? Micah beat Pentiment on Switch. Oh. oh That's she another beat game Pentiment? I got to get to at some point. I bought it and downloaded it. But I got to get to that as well. Okay. Jonathan Turner wrote in, said, hello, steamed gentlemen of the sacred variety. You said scared but I think you mean sacred. I'd like to offer an alternative analogy to explain why some are expressing dissatisfaction with the lack of first party offerings from PlayStation and why the response, who cares if it's first party, as long as it's good may not suffice for them. Imagine you have a world renowned chef as a friend over the years. They've invited you to their restaurant and treated you to the dishes they created and cooked in their kitchen. Then one day they inform you that a colleague will be taking over the kitchen for dinner service. While you trust your friend's taste and enjoy the colleague's food, you start to miss your friend's unique touch. Despite the quality of the new dishes, there's a je ne sais quoi about your friend's cooking that drew, drew you to the restaurant in the first place. Even though you appreciate the colleague's cuisine, it's not quite the same. A response like, who cares if your friend cooked it or not? It's still good. May not resonate with a lot of people. Dustin, what are your mm. thoughts here? Are we overstating the who cares if it's first party as long as it's good? I have a very specific way to answer this, but I'd actually like to hear you guys first. I think this comes down to a preference in that I think PlayStation first party games are amazing. And very, very good. But I don't think they have some kind of, no pun intended, secret sauce here that's making it so good in that many other development teams, for my taste, make just as good and sometimes better <laughs> games than PlayStation First Party. And I think, too, that, I don't know, if we really want to run with your analogy. It's like, well, let, let your friend cook for now. Let him cook, you know. And it's not that they're closing down the restaurant. And yeah. then you have nothing to eat. You're still let's, being provided for. Let's keep with this. Let's keep this analogy going. Yeah, let's let's keep yeah. it going. You know, there's there's a there's plenty of good stuff to play. And I I don't want to be totally dismissive because I understand that there is a particular quality to PlayStation first party. But I don't I just and I think about how PlayStation views their first party and that they want to have the utmost highest quality for their games and we look at how much dev times have increased in general across the board then yeah it makes sense that playstation is their first party it's going to take longer between each game now more than ever and so let them cook and i think as i would say i mean it feels like and i don't know anything but it feels like we're right on the verge in the next few months maybe around summertime getting a ghost of tsushima 2 reveal and then you won't have to feel sad anymore because your friend's cooking will be back. <laughs> he's not cooking Sly Cooper, but he's cooking this. Oh, yeah. You can't cook. Uh, you can't have, you can have too many things cooking in, on the stove. In the, on the range in the restaurant. In the analogy. Oh, what? The aliens have arrived. Whoa. <laughs> I don't know if that came through. I don't no, know if that came through on, on camera. Every, like, there was like a slight surge. Where everything, everything went black for a second. For like a split second. Oh. Like your power went out? Yeah, the power. Yeah. But what the? F wow. All you're right, still connected. Right, okay. All right. Whatever. <laughs> that was wild. My power I went out yesterday. about Zencaster and it, it held on. Yeah, that, it held no. on. Thank God. But like my power went off yesterday. So I'm like keenly being aware. I was like, so, mm. it's, I think it's because it's been raining so fucking much. But um, all right. So let's hear from you about this, Chris. Uh, are you are we. Are first party games more important than we we let on? I just I feel like it's inherently this is going to weigh differently on on 
different people based on their preferences. I think I think if you are the person where every Sony first party game that comes out is your favorite game of that year, I think you're probably mean, meaningfully disappointed in the lack of output and that would make that would make sense. If Ghost of Tsushima was your favorite game that year, if if like, you know, Spider-Man and, and God of God of War Ragnarok and and these are like these are like ah it can't get better than this. Then I would understand and I I get that. It's just I guess from my perspective, and I guess seemingly Dustin's as well, it's just that's not necessarily the case. It's not that they're not good. Um, uh, it, it's it's kind of like having, I don't know, sometimes you'll have the most expensive dish at a restaurant and you'll be like, yes, yeah, it's, it's very good. But I kind of just wanted the, I, I kind of wanted the mushroom truffle pasta personally, which is like <laughs> $20 cheaper and did I enjoy quite a bit more and that to me is like hell divers to me it was like well hell divers is unequivocally like the most fun that i've had with like a sony first party game in like a long time like I, it's not the most engaging the it's not the most engaged i have been with the narrative for sure i i, I could give a fuck less <laughs> what the hell's going on with like i i pick up i interact with those those pads just to do it just in case a trophy pops up or something or, or like or, or for statistic reasons like i just i don't even I've, I've read like a handful of them and I'm like, all right, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, and so to me, it's like, that's a $40 game that comes out of Sony's kind of, well, that's a second party relationship, right? So I, that's, that's my dish that I'm happy to get that I'm really stoked for. And anything else doesn't really matter. So like, I, I, it really all does depend on, on the tastes, <laughs> no pun intended, of the people having this conversation. Um, and I think for some people, it's going to hit hard that there aren't first party games out at the at a frequent capacity that they used to be in the PS3 or maybe even early PS4 generation. And now and now it's slowing down a little bit and they need to take time. But at the same time, I would I would remind you that, you know, that time isn't being wasted. It's not like it's not like in the time that you're not playing a Sony first party game, that one isn't being created or crafted like you, you've got a lot to look forward to. And the time in between is necessary for that meal to be worth the wait in the first place. And that's, that is, is, is where I would, we're, we're stretching the end of <laughs> this analogy. Yeah. I can't go with the analogy but, anymore. I got to let it, but, uh, but I, I think it makes sense, you know, like, yeah, we're going to have like a year where we're not going to have um, a first party release and that's fine because ultimately that time is going towards making the next first party release um, worth the wait in the first place. And uh, just, just be patient. There's so much to play. That to me is where I, what I don't understand. Like I'm overwhelmed just looking at everything. So I just don't understand the, the mentality of like, where's, where is it? Where's the game? <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's dude, not like I, they're just sitting around. Like, yeah. oh, we don't need to do anything. So we're just going to hang out. You know, they're just, uh, they're, I think Sony's understood that they can keep their powder dry and that I, that's good. Uh, I mean, they don't, they don't need to release anything from first party and they're able to let their developers have more time to work on it and they can make their third party publishers happy by spotlighting their games. So from their perspective, it's kind of a win all around. So I get yeah. it that it might not feel like a win for those fans, but again, let them cook. Yeah. Uh, I'll say this, that I think that, some of the highest quality games ever made have come from PlayStation Studios. So there's no doubt that they bring a level of quality that many other publishers would dream about. But I also reject that just because a game is made by a PlayStation Studio makes it better or something special. That's not necessarily true. I was told over and over again how bad Days Gone was by everyone. Uh, Dreams was an obvious failure. Japan Studios games sold so little that they shut that studio down without even a second thought, even though everyone apparently loved them. It's like the whole Woodstock thing. Like there were 100,000 people at Woodstock, but 8 million people were at Woodstock. That's kind of like listening to people talk about how much they love Gravity Rush, a game that sold like 50,000 copies <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't that bad, but it's like pretty bad. And I, so I just reject this idea that it's like the chef is from PlayStation in this analogy. And so like, it's automatically the best. It's like, no, it's going to be, well above the median quality probably 
Mm-hmm. And I think games like Spider-Man 2 and God of War are very impressive games in a lot of different ways. I don't love them more than I love a lot of other games. Games like The Last of Us or Horizon that I think are more game of the year quality games come every few every few years, no doubt. But there are many games in the interim, as has been noted, that are really in the same in the same, I don't know, territory of greatness. And I think part of what makes it exciting to play on PlayStation or any console is to get the full breadth of experiences there. To me, sticking around for exclusives is a very Nintendo thing. And even that is an old Nintendo thing because Nintendo gets so many ports in indie games and kind of sets the cadence outside of its own ecosystem now that it's very different from really the, I would argue the exclusivity thing really really began in earnest with the n64 and into the gamecube and the wii mm-hmm. obviously the nes and snes had a many awesome exclusives but it wasn't quite about that then people didn't really know where the games were coming from they didn't really care when people started really aiming and it's like oh well the n64 has like these 30 really good games and 25 of them are for nintendo it's like okay but that's not the case and so i i That's why it's not that it doesn't matter. Of course, when you see the PlayStation Studios splash screen and you see a Naughty Dog logo come up and stuff, it's very exciting. It means it's going to be of the highest possible quality. But the manufacture of these games is incredibly difficult and they're going to necessarily be more spread out based on what Dustin was noting about cost and and investment and time and all the rest. So I just I get why people are frustrated, but I can't honestly sit here and tell you that I'm not having a great time with my PlayStation 5 because of the lack of Sony games, because it's not true. I feel very, very satisfied with the PlayStation 5, exactly the way it is. And getting even more would be like an embarrassment of riches. I feel like it's a really good situation it's in right now. But I think that people have to have a more open mind. And God, I'm not even exposed to many of the games people play most on the console, like all the free to play games, the sports games and all that. Like, I don't even care about that. That is PlayStation to a lot of people. I think we're getting a little myopic with the way we sometimes describe these spaces. Yeah, it's it, we're getting a little greedy, especially because like, dude, last year was so good, and this year is looking to be, it's 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 at least starting off really well, and then next year you have presumably GTA Six, which is going to be fucking huge. Like, I, it feels like we're going to be eating good for a while, and we can expect even in the next uh, for the rest of this year, and then then twenty 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 five, there's a, going to be at least something from PlayStation. So like, I I I just don't know what the rush is. Uh, I think the rush is kind of inherently. Like, if you, if you love these games, you have to be okay with the weight in some way. Um, I appreciate the write-in, because I know that this is a topic that matters to a lot of people. This, this is kind of a Venn diagram of PlayStation games going to PC. It's like this: there's, there's some sort of angst about the new reality, but I would suggest that PlayStation's level of above median quality has demanded unfortunately higher investments in time and money to execute on what was once cheaper and easier to do and it's what neil Druckmann was saying last week when we discussed it he's like you have to and it's the it's like a woe is me situation but imagine the pressure of making a game at naughty dog where everyone is going to pull it apart it's got to be better than the last thing you did it has to be at some point that's not possible at some point, they're going to take a step back. I don't think they have yet, but like a noticeable step back. And, and if they don't, it's an amazing accomplishment every time it happens and that doesn't happen. And that they don't fall back and that there's not a red fall. You know, or yeah. something like that. No offense. Yeah, let's hope not. Or, you know, or something ill-conceived like Twisted Metal getting canceled to me suggests that they looked at something like Destruction All-Stars and were like, maybe this just isn't it. You know? I mm-hmm. less is more in an ecosystem where 15,000 games a year come out. <laughs> You're right. I say you really want to pop personally. Use that meteor from space explosion at a PlayStation Studios game demands and make sure that it hits every time. That's much more important than yeah. more games. No, 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 no. We don't need more games. We need fewer games, not from PlayStation necessarily, but just generally, again, getting back to the three fifths compromise. <laughs> BMJ614 Hey wielders of the sacred symbols I've become infatuated with the Capcom versus SNK series as of late oh you should talk to Dagan and I think I have a pretty cool question related to one of the greatest collabs in video game history what developers do you want to collaborate together to make a stellar video game 
Does that have to be a fighting game? But please share what type of game it is, if not so. I'm not even going to say it as an example because it might be one of y'all's answers. It always does resort to fighting game stuff. I mean, even you see there's a Street Fighter cross Tekken and all. It always does. Obviously, Marvel versus Capcom. It always does resort to fighting, but I do think it's the best genre for it. It's hard for me to think of a genre, another genre that would really be it. Maybe you could do some sort of really zany first person shooter, I guess, or a third person shooter similar to Fortnite. But I like the idea of crossover fighting games. To me, that's yeah. where my mind would be. I guess you could do something like Mega Man Soccer or some weird shit like that if you wanted to. Or what those old, <laughs> but I, I, I gotta say. It would be really it would it will never, ever happen. But PlayStation and Nintendo doing a crossover fighting game would be in the style even of Smash Brothers, maybe even like a. A a Smash Brothers spinoff, you know, that's not Smash Brothers, whatever, but Smash Brothers versus (laughs) Super Smash Relatives. Yeah, like Super (laughs) Smash (laughs) Super Smash Smash Rivals. (laughs) That would be cool. That sounds dope you know super smash rivals or something like that and let very similar to bandai namco kind of taking over smash brothers like let that let let a third party kind of ingest it and whatever they come out with what i I think would be pretty impressive it would just be cool to see that wall broken down there nintendo obviously has a storied catalog of characters but i would argue that it's not as extent like i think the new smash brothers games especially the most recent one has really exposed it to not it is not an 80 person roster or whatever. Like there is a limit. Like it's like, all right, dude, 17 Fire Emblem characters. Like get it. Like, yeah. You, um, but you could, you can narrow it down to like 25. Ec- Imagine a game like this, 25 excellent Nintendo characters, 25 excellent PlayStation characters, and then 25 excellent shared third party characters from, like your Mega Man's and your Resident Evils and your Metal Gears and all whatever, you're pretty cool, you know. I, yeah. So that's my answer, but that's never going to happen in a million years. So yeah. Sony Pictures making that Zelda movie could be an icebreaker. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts, guys? Uh, so I have one that's kind of like that, Colin. Where I wrote Capcom versus Square Enix, where it would not just be Capcom as in Street Fighter, but like. Leon Kennedy versus Leon from Final Fantasy VIII, you know, in a fighting wow. scenario or something like that. Or even, you know, Mega Man. You could play as Mega Man and you could beat the shit out of the Moogle uh, or something like that. Just to shoot his head off with my arm cannon. Yeah. Or Chadley, that little fuck. He needs someone needs to beat him up. Chadley, I, it was, I was reminded, I read in the Discord that I said on the Final Fantasy VII conversation we had back in 2020 that your love interest was Chadley. <laughs> yeah uh, oh man so that's the main one the other two i wrote this one for the people uh because i don't necessarily really want this but a from software castlevania game of course after seeing bloodborne i would rather have from software make their own worlds but seeing a game like that would be very cool and then i wrote a wild one and i'm curious what you think about this chris this is there's no reason this should ex- exist but I wrote Studio MDHR, so the creators of Cuphead, making a Doom game that's like in the <laughs> style of Contra. So you have the Doom guy running around, and it's all cartoony, fighting huh. and ripping apart demons. So you get a little bit of that'd be interesting. Contrast. So it's, it's, yeah, it's it's kind of like a like it, it, that would be like a, like a 1930s looking metal slug sorta. Yeah, it, that'd be fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, the, the more I think about this, um, I don't know. The, the more I, I would love to see, and, and granted, this is in in a, in a perfect world where uh, these studios operated in a little bit more of an efficient way than they currently are. But I would authentically love to see a dice uh, Halo game in, in in some way. And what I mean by that is like a battle, like a proper battlefield style. Uh, first person shooter in that universe I think would be dope but honestly as I think about this question is really kind of focused on you know collab like collabs and crossovers and we brought up the crossover fighter and the Nintendo versus PlayStation one is like a dream a dream game but will never happen as we stated the sad reality is like I feel very very jaded to a lot of crossovers now because the whole multiverse thing has been 
so fucking just ravaged and molested <laughs> to the point where like i remember it was like a we, we we talked about on a recent episode of sacred right where, it's, where what was it dave the diver and godzilla and you're like okay i like nothing surprises yeah. me at this point you like, I, yeah like back in the day I remember, I remember it was like a big deal for for um uh solid snake to be in brawl i remember that was like a crazy thing i was like what the fuck solid snakes in super smash brothers that's insane and now I wouldn't I wouldn't even think twice about it. I wouldn't think twice at seeing like <laughs> fucking <laughs> Joe Biden in Fortnite. You know what I mean? Or, or, or like anything like that to the point where a lot of anything that I see that's like a crossover or like this X this at the Xbox showcase. They had like that weird indie game with Chucky and it's like, a, <sighs> OK, I guess I guess it's happening. Chucky's coming to Roblox as if. Mm-hmm. As if I give a shit at all. Um, and it's just like, I don't know, a lot of that magic of seeing characters share the screen that you would have never thought was possible, I think it's kind of a lot more muted than it used to be. And not even just owing to video games, but like owing to just like, I don't know, even just like certain movies like with Space Jam where they had the Clockwork Orange rapists watching the, the, watching the game and <laughs> Ready Player One with, oh, it's Iron Giant and, and Master Chief and... Ronald McDonald and I, I don't know Ronald Reagan, I, yeah, and Ronald Reagan. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I there's a there's an Iron Giant. It seems, and we got to get him on Hell Divers. <laughs> We're going to kill him. <laughs> We're going to kill that Iron Giant dead, <laughs> <laughs> Mister Giant. Tear down this wall. <laughs> so stupid. Do you guys remember? You know, everything's crossover now. Yeah. I remember the original crossover. There's like this anti-drug cartoon that featured all the it had like Winnie the Pooh and Smurfs. Oh, oh yeah. And uh and like Kermit the Frog in it. Oh, I, don't yeah. know. I looked it up. It's called uh uh what was it? Are you Ca- Cartoon Apple? All-Stars to the Rescue. Just telling you not that. to do heroin. I think I I think that was in like a an AVGN video is how I saw it or something like that. Oh. I remember that's how I felt cuz there's no way I was exposed to that just like on TV. That wasn't I don't even think Smurfs had even a remote amount of relevance by the time I was even alive um, and cognizant. But yeah, I do remember that that video. Now that you now that you mention it, yeah, it's upsetting. I don't know. It's just am I am I alone in in the idea that like seeing seeing these kind of crossovers is like a little bit less special now? Oh, totally. You're absolutely you're right on. It's it's. Uh, I used to love the the sitcom crossovers when I was a kid, like, right. Uh, like family matters in full house like and just grounding them in the same universe or whatever but yeah, yeah. It, it is it is far less interesting and far less special now i guess the first crossover that i ever really experienced as a kid was captain n in some way which was you know legendary cartoon when i was a kid a nintendo cartoon but even that was nintendo characters so it wasn't right that unusual they well actually mega man and trevor belmont were two of the characters they're not necessarily nintendo characters but um God, that cartoon's horrifying. If you go back and look at it, I loved that cartoon and I look at it now and I'm like, this shit sucks. But we were so <laughs> we were so into uh, Nintendo and just having yeah. anything that like there was this brief moment from like 88 to 91 or so where Nintendo was like, yeah, we'll fuck around with licenses. It was an exciting time, you know, and then they were like, no, never mind. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, the Mario movie scared them for 30 years. All right. BMJ, thank you for writing in. Preston Brinton wrote in and said, hey, sacred semen slurpers. That's fucking disgusting. <laughs> God. But I'll allow it. What are your thoughts on the recent statements from Warner Brothers regarding the pivot to more live service games? Last year, they had the best selling game of the year in Hogwarts Legacy, which also received a lot of praise from fans of the franchise while also receiving backlash from for live service games. Suicide Squad has had a poor service and reception due to these elements and Mortal Kombat has paid DLC, which has received a lot of pushback from the fighting community. So I didn't want to put this in the news because I'm not really sure what the nature of this conversation is, but we, I wanted to acknowledge it in some way because people did write in about this. So over at GameSpot, long time, their, their long time uh, news editor, Eddie wrote up this piece entitled Warner brothers discusses volatile AAA console games. will lean into free to play and mobile. So, Speaking, at, he writes here, speaking at a Morgan Stanley speaking event. Okay. So know your audience. 
Right. It says, quote, Warner Brothers Discovery Gaming boss J.B. Perrette discussed some of the company's strategy for going forward for gaming going forward, and it includes more live service, mobile and free to play games. He said, quote, we're doubling down on games as an area where we think there is a lot of growth opportunity that we can tap into with IP that we have and some of the capabilities we have from the studios where we are uniquely positioned as both a publisher and a developer of games, end quote. Perrette said WBD's recent gaming output has focused on AAA games for console, and that's great when a game like Hogwarts Legacy sells 22 million copies and becomes the best-selling game of the year. But this kind of success is never guaranteed in what Perrette said was a volatile market. He pointed out that one of WB's latest big games, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, was a disappointment for the company. And so it says, so the plan going forward, he said, is to help reduce volatility by focusing on core franchises and bringing at least some of them to the mobile and free-to-play space, as well as continuing to invest in live service games that people play and spend money on over a long period of time. This will help Warner Brothers generate more consistent revenue, he said, going on to tease that Warner Brothers has had some new mobile free-to-play games this year. Also worth noting that just because Warner Brothers may push into new places, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll stop making big single-player AAA games. It says, quote, rather than just launching a one-and-done console game, how do we develop a game around, for an example, a Hogwarts Legacy or Harry Potter that is a live service where people can live and work and build and play in that world on an ongoing basis? So people can go read the story more, but I'm... Not entirely sure it says what people are saying it says. Because, mm-hmm. and I'm glad that Eddie had kind of the honesty to say, like, they're not saying that they're going to d- just do this, that they're going to pursue this. And I feel like there is some level of intelligence to that. I've said that about PlayStation's own pursuit of games as a service. Like, you do want to be in that space. You want to be in that space heavily and you want to make lots of money in that space and you want to dominate in that space. It's a space of time of dominating people's engagement. You need to be there. Um, but it does come off as a little tone deaf when you don't acknowledge and it doesn't seem like they really did the rampant success of Hogwarts Legacy. I did this math in our in our discord yesterday, but Warner Brothers is selling every copy of of uh, their game uh, Hogwarts Legacy through all these different platforms as a third party. There is no place for them to sell it as a first party. Right. So you're looking at about forty two dollars in a rip. Um, per game sold once you know they get their money. This is um, $924 million. Now, let's assume the game costs $200 million to make and another $100 million to market. And let's assume that the licensing cost of J.K. Rowling is another $100 million. This leaves $400 million or so in profit. And to me, I would think you would want to highlight this as Warner Brothers and say, while we're going to go pursue these games as a service, and while we know that we have a notable failure in Kill the Justice League, right, in this space, we're going to continue to pursue this nonetheless, we can find success in these other spaces, too, by giving these games enough time and space. And it just seems weird that they wouldn't bring up both because yeah. you can have it both ways. You should want to have it both ways. And what they should really be saying is, like, we want to we want to sell games that sell 10, 15, 20 million copies, regardless of of how we do it. But it really does go to show you what I say over and over again and why I don't mean to diminish Helldiver's amazing success, but why I keep saying it's not necessarily what Sony wants. I'm sure Sony is far from upset about Helldiver's success, but we're still talking about a game that will only generate a few hundred million dollars in profit long term. Like these are this is a game that's sold once. And when you're looking at these publishers, looking at a game like Hogwarts Legacy and kind of poo pooing it. It does show that something is fundamentally broken. Um, in the C-suites of these companies that they just don't see that you can do both and that you don't need to put all your eggs into one basket. These guys are, I don't know. I don't want to say they're dangerous, but they feel dangerous. Then that they're going to make these huge decisions that take years and years to pan out. Cost hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, look at, look at the state of like, who cares about what Rocksteady does now? It's yeah. like when people say Dragon Age is coming out later this year. It's like, and it is apparently it's like, who cares? You have to you have a lot to prove like who gives a fuck until you show us and surprise me and delight me. But I don't know anything to say about this. Dustin, let's go to you first. I I don't think I have anything really to add than what you said. It it sounds more like there's more to the story, of course, than there's just a a fancy Twitter headline. But the. the success of Hogwarts Legacy, I think, speaks that there's no way they're like, oh, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> they're going to do a sequel. Um, I just yeah. hope that the the only thing I'll say, I guess, is just I hope that they don't try to be like, oh, well, let's combine these two success or 
take the success of Hogwarts Legacy or games like it and we'll add live service elements to that so we can have our cake and eat it too. Because uh, that I don't think will work out favorably for them. There's a level of mental retardation if they don't go to Avalanche and haven't already done it and said, we want a straight up sequel to this game. Reuse yeah. all of the assets. But and add things and obviously, but you have three years to make a fucking sequel. And even if it sells half as many copies. It's just strange that I would think the licensing would be the problem for them, but it's not. They're actually totally dependent on licenses. But what they're saying is, is that they kind of can lean into the licenses in which they own. Um, right. Because that's what puts games like Spider-Man in such financial peril, in quotes, where they're only making 30 percent profit you know, margins because they have to pay so much money to outside, you know, in this case, Disney outside really non-creative forces in the sense that they had nothing to do with the product. All right. Preston, thank you for writing in. Vincent. Let's see if I can do this. Vincent Brancatasi Brancatasiano. No, Vincent Brancatasano. Brancatasano. Nice. You made that up. It says hi all. He wrote in like many, 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 many of you did. Did I want to talk about this topic? Not particularly, but I'm not going to ignore you. Recently subscribed after being a tight ass for a few years and love the early content. Thank you. Anyway, Sweet Baby Inc. has been in the media a fair bit these last days, few days. As yet somehow mainstream gaming media has always skipped the story. Just wondering your thoughts on all the hullabaloo surrounding forced diversity in gaming. And if any of you heard the speech from a few years ago by Sweet Baby Inc. Uh, CEO Kim Belair about terrifying game companies in quotes. Thanks for the amazing content. Love it and love you guys. So Vincent and others will remember that we talked about Sweet Baby Inc. maybe a few months ago. And at the time, yeah. I talked about that they're obviously a DEI consultancy. I mean, it's clear as day, but that I believe that there has to be embraced in creative as in creative fields, a level of like free association. So if they're not, if companies are not being forced in some way to use these companies, then what are you really supposed to do about that? Um other than not solicit their work or whatever. And I didn't really look at this and I still don't really look at it as that big of a deal. However, there is a big, however, here that has developed the, I don't know if you guys saw the, like the, the impetus of this, but when I saw this happening, I was like, ah, this isn't going to be good. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Someone on steam made a curation list. That puts all of Sweet Baby's consulting game, you know, the games that they consulted on. So so they're bigger games and they're smaller games, all of them, onto a list that would make people aware that they were associated in some way with these games as like a writing consultancy. And that in and of itself doesn't bother me. I mean, I think that that's kind of the the purpose of these sorts of things. I feel like you should have maximal freedom of expression to associate whatever you want with whatever you want and make people aware of those things. That, that, That stuff doesn't bother me at all. And that's not what I thought that was the bad thing. What I thought was the bad thing was when I saw one of the people from this company trying to get this um, this curation list banned and Mm -hmm. to get the person who put the curation list up banned and to get him to base people to basically hound this guy on social media. When I saw that happen, um, I was like, "Mm, no, that's not a good thing. You're very, very dumb. And this is this is. What we witnessed was, you know, I've said before that one of the stupidest people that ever worked in the video games industry was this woman, Lee Alexander. And she was stupid for a number of different reasons, but a major reason she was stupid was that during Gamergate 10 years ago, she was the one that wrote that very ill-conceived Gamers Are Dead article. And that was what set, she was responsible for the orders of magnitude escalation of what was otherwise this very self-contained thing. Right. And when I saw the the list on Steam and the community growing around it, I was like, that's one thing. When you're trying to go after that, that's an entirely different thing. It looks like you have something to hide. It looks like you are ashamed of something. And I don't understand why you're why you're trying to kind of and I'm saying the royal you out there that are defending this being cagey about what it is, whether or not they have the right to do it or whether it's a good idea or whatever is a totally different thing. And I'm not going to get in the way of the free market kind of functioning as it, as it does, but you are a DEI consultancy. Don't try to act like you're not. And you edited 
and I've seen this, the website has been edited since then to make it seem like it is less about that than it actually right. was. You can find video of Kim Belair, their CEO, saying exactly that, that you kind of, in so many words, leverage this level of fear at these companies to get them to kind of take your political point of view. And if it's not political, and this is an important thing, if Sweet Baby Inc. is just what it is, it's just a writing, writer's consultancy, I want to know what the politics of all the people that work there are. Because that should be easy to pan out as, as there's a collection of of very talented writers. But something tells me that you all <laughs> think the exact same about all of those topics. And that is by design. So right. that's kind of where I stand on the sweet baby thing is not that I think that they have an extraordinary amount of power, not that I think that they shouldn't <laughs> be allowed to transact with other companies or even have a say in what those companies do because that's all voluntary. But to hide from it and to pretend and to not lean into it is very ill-conceived and makes it seem like there's some more to this story. And this is this is very much a gamers are dead article moment. And yeah. the only difference now, unfortunately, for these people and for the media that will no doubt defend them, and they already have, and we can talk about that too, is they are in a much worse position than they were 10 years ago in this industry. Their power has diminished to nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that normal, everyday people have an extraordinary amount of power. And so the it is a very unbalanced situation. And if I were, again, realizing that mountains turn out come out of molehills, I would realize you're in the molehill stage now and that you're going to lose and just be like, recede into the background and we'll do business, you know, to business as usual. But you know, Chris, that yeah. these people do not have the fortitude or the patience. They cannot help it. They cannot help it. And then you see, you see things like this, this writer, Alyssa Mercant at Kotaku really coping you know with this dishonest she writes this entire piece about this without ever noting how it started yeah. which is that they tried to get the group banned very weird have you guys been tracking this chris let's go to you first what do you think yeah i've, I've kept up a little bit with it I, i've gotten a lot of messages about it and uh it's it's just such it's so unfortunate how little self-preservation certain <laughs> certain people not even just from like a oh I better not tell the truth uh because the truth makes me uh, makes me look bad it's more just like the fact that they were they're willing to hide things that aren't a big deal and in and, and as a result come off guilty like editing the website is just such a unnecessary thing because there's nothing wrong inherently with being a DEI, there's nothing that, that that's fine. And so to hide that makes you look sketchy and weird. And do I, look, I, I don't know. I feel so many different ways about this. Do I feel like Sweet Baby Inc. has any power over the games industry at all? No. <laughs> I think people are vastly overestimating their power level here. I do think that that video of like the CEO talking about like, yeah, we want to scare, we want to scare uh, companies into, into thinking the way we do. It's like, I'm sure she believes that she has the power to do that. But I, I don't believe that she has the power to do that. And I, I believe that the people who believe that she has the power to do that are huffing the same fucking paint that she is, quite frankly. Like, I, I just the, the idea that this not even the biggest consultancy of, of its size like this has any real like real material impact, like real material impact on the quality of the games coming out is fucking asinine. Like, quite frankly, like, like Helldivers 2 could have some of the most woke data entries in the world, <laughs> and it would still be some of the most fun fucking gameplay that I've experienced in, in a long ass time. That is not really the fundamental problem with the industry that we're having. Right. But. They just they they did shoot themselves in the foot with this shit. Like, I don't know why you would go out of your way, come out of your corporate comfortability to in to involve yourself in trying to ban a curation list, which is totally allowed. And sure. Like do, are some of these people like, like conspiracy theorists that in my opinion are like probably like a little bit too far gone. Sure. But you've just made it so much worse for yourself and probably a lot of other people by even remotely engaging with this in the, in the dishonest way that you've engaged with it. And that's kind of my takeaway from it. I don't think this is like a nuclear thing. I don't think I, I really don't believe sweet baby has the power that they think they do. Uh, or at least that they project that they seem to think they do. Um, 
but they acted like they do. <laughs> and as a result of that, they're going to, man, they're, they're, <laughs> they're about to get assaulted. Like by a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of angry people who have a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> so, what do you think, Dustin? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this and I, I watched some videos that, about like the people that were deeply upset, which I put my YouTube on uh, incognito mode because I didn't want <laughs> my algorithm to be filled with yeah. look at this woke trash constantly. But the thing that was most interesting to me was that it was very much a look at this game. Look how it's bad. Now, look how Sweet Baby Inc. Right, is attached. Yeah. Look at this game. Look how it's bad. And th they're attached, which in a lot of the cases, these games are not bad games at all, like God of War or something like that. They're just mad because the one character that was blue in more North mythology is is black. Right. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah. That's like, come, OK, but my point is that I think that there's a big confusion about correlation and causation here between Sweet Baby Inc. and these games. Like the reason why Suicide Squad is bad is not because of Sweet Baby Inc. <laughs> Period. There may be things you don't like in it that makes it bad to you, but that's not what made the game bad. Um, and I, at the same time, don't want to undercut that um, what they're doing and how they're handling this whole situation is bad and sucks completely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And overall, the idea of forcing messages into games that don't belong is not a preference of mine either. So I don't want to come off as this defender of, of sweet baby ink, but I think that, um, I think that like Chris was saying, there's a lot more power attributed to them than actually exists. And I think the other thing to consider, this was the point I wanted to make the, the thing to consider too, is just that, a lot of these developers exist and have the same mindset as Sweet Baby Inc. And so if you're really, truly upset about these things, then you should be upset with the developers and or you should talk, <laughs> complain to them about hiring them in addition to that, too, just because to think that the, the genesis of this stuff happening in games comes from this one single company is extremely short sighted. Yeah. So. The, the one other thing I want to say to Colin, you mentioned the Kotaku article and and how uh, I don't know if you saw this tweet where she tweeted the article and someone asked, does this article mention anything about the Sweet Baby Inc. CEO being a full blown racist? Because I have a feeling this article doesn't mention it. And she responded and said, hi, you can't be racist against white people. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, yeah. All ca all exclamation really points. believe that? Like, are they this is, that? This is, this is the damage that BuzzFeed did by yeah. boiling down academic terminology and boiling it down and dumbing it down to the point where they were like, let's monetize. Let, let's make re really like eye catching monetizable videos about these highly academic subjects that we don't fucking understand and 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 feed it to like millions of uneducated you know, uh, young teens who are going to be watching our, our content like this, this, that's what, this is the fallout of that. Cause that's just not, that's not even what, <laughs> that's not even what that, that academia, uh, that academic concept even means the idea of like, Oh, racism equals prejudice plus plus power. And because minorities don't have power, they can't be racist. That's that, that, uh, that's a systemic issue. That's talking about systems. That's not interpersonal. It doesn't make any sense. You could absolutely be a racist black person. Ask Tom Sweeney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just an, the people that are obsessed with everyone's skin color are the ones going to tell you who is and who isn't racist. It's like, yeah, it's, nah, I don't insane. think so. The, it really does go back to you guys have said it all well enough is that. Just lean into it. We I, I know what you are. We know. It's not a secret. It's like that old meme that circulates a lot in, in, in political circles where it's like, this thing isn't happening. Yeah, that thing is, is happening, but it's not how you're describing it. Yeah, that thing is happening and it's as easy to describe it, but it's not bad. All right, so that thing's happening. So what? You know, like, it's like how, right. and we're right now in the early stages of, oh no, this, this isn't a DEI consultancy. 
that's totally predicated on that. No, everyone that works here isn't obsessed with race and gender and has the same exact political viewpoints. And a great point is, is that Insomniac is, and I hate to tell people this, maybe the most in quotes woke company in the entire industry, like by a mile. Mm -hmm. They don't need anyone to tell them to do this shit, especially they're yeah. way, well, they're way well, out of control. I think with even just some of like, not that you shouldn't have a position on the Israeli but versus Palestine thing, for instance, like whatever. But why are you making your logo on social media, the Palestinian flag like that seems to be so. That's such a political statement. I don't want to make political statements like that personally, nonetheless, as a company, you know, yeah. that's a that's a deep level of comfort I'm, in a certain structure that doesn't need to be goaded by something like Sweet Baby in because they're very comfortable. already. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I really want to hammer hammer in uh, something that Dustin said is that the industry is already inhabited by a lot of people who um, are of this political um, persuasion, you know, and I, I don't think like it's not that Sweet Baby Inc. exists and is going out to companies that wouldn't have thought to put a black woman in their game and making them do it. It's that companies or 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 just any, you know, marginalized group or minority or what have you. It's that these companies are already doing that. And because they're doing that, they want to handle it with care. And so they're going to a place that's specifically designed to do that. That is like, that's fundamentally what is happening, you know? And there's nothing inherently wrong with any of that, by the way. It's just like when, but when your company is, is pretending not to be that, it's, it's, why are you embarrassed to be that if you believe that? That's what I, that's, that, that to me doesn't square at all. So I don't know. I just wanted to make, make that clear because there, yeah. there needs to be an understanding of cause and effect. And I mean, th th these people who are complaining about, or, or not complaining, but like talking about Sweet Baby Inc. In, in, in the manner that they're talking about, have been complaining about, you know, these problems in the industry for a while now. And those problems exist, those pre predate Sweet Baby Inc. by their own belief. So, like, this is not, this it's is just not the a, origin. You know, it's an I mean? Ouroboros, dude. It all just feeds itself. Like, they can't, these disparate elements can't exist without each other. Like, it's what I was saying earlier about this spectrum of like things aren't happening to things are happening and it's totally fine or whatever. And the, the forced DEI and all that kind of stuff. It's like, I find that to be totally counterproductive and regressive in a lot of different ways. But my whole point is simply that you can't do anything about people being interested or leaning into that as long as it's not done by force. That's what makes it, so interesting to hear the CEO say about scaring people and stuff, because that's that's not force, but that's a level of coercion that yeah. you would think you wouldn't want to even admit you would need to exercise. In other words, you would want it to be blatantly obvious that your service is needed because you're so good at what you do. A little strange, right, yeah. but here's the major thing that I want to I want to say at the end and we can we can move on from this topic for now, although I, I suspect we're just in the beginning of this topic. Unfortunately. Um, and, and I'm not saying it because I'm dismissive of all things like I, I do think that there is like a wokeness quote problem. I just don't like that word. I just don't think I think it's too reductive. It's very similar to like, you know, saying things are triggering you or something or just like the old like Trump era buzzwords from like when he first ran. Right. Like, yeah. I just feel like we I never liked that kind of shit. And I don't I, I just feel like there's a better way to describe what we all know is happening. But I'm also not into the whole like, oh, it's not happening. And you're a fucking crazy for noticing. I'm sick of that shit. And that is a lot of that is so it's a it's mocking you and telling you that the emperor and you, and you can't even say the emperor has no clothes. And I think that shit's pathetic. But the major thing that I think is worth noting as we close out is how do you even put this there's there's this weird power imbalance between certain people in the industry games publishers and all this kind of stuff and people read into it this sort of need to stick a flag into every into every topic and make it into its own issue and this is something that we're talking about very deeply with with people on and quote unquote both sides. And I just choose to believe that generally speaking, the market will kind of wash these things out 
a lot of the games that people are talking about that Sweet Baby Inc. worked on are failures. Is it because of them, as was noted earlier? I doubt it. But they certainly didn't help it. And Mm. I just think that there needs to be a level of, again, just to kind of reiterate, a level of honesty about what you are and the role you play in the in the fiascos that undercut everything in our gaming industry. And it just bothers me when people start fires and then walk away from them like they're not responsible in some way for starting the fire. And I want to say this as a postscript, because this is something especially Alyssa Mercant and other people in the industry need to learn. If a major audience is mad at you for something you wrote, it could be that what you wrote sucked. It's possible that it's not everyone else, but that it is you. And it is your poor definition of the uh, of and and describing this this fiasco with ignore with with ignoring everything that started and how it started. And. I said this months ago, Kotaku has a big problem on their hands because no one likes them and you cannot survive in that ecosystem for long. It's not funny that people don't like you. It's not funny that you're a joke. That's a weird thing to laugh about when there are plenty of people in this industry doing great work and lapping you many times over. I don't even bother getting in touch with these people anymore because I know that they won't want to talk and that's totally fine. But you are ill prepared for the actual dialogue. You are ill prepared for the actual situations at hand that you talk about and you know so little about them and there's so much pride in it. And then you wear the Wojak face with the crying mask underneath, but it's, you know, over it, you're smiling. We all know. Mm -hmm. There's just no way. And it's not to say you deserve it. It's to say, look inward, maybe. Sometimes it is your fault. Sometimes you are the problem. That's for all of us. This, This externalizing projection is it's enough already, but we have, we're going to have a lot of time to talk about this because I don't <laughs> think this is going away. I think, and maybe it shouldn't go away. I don't know. There's a dismissiveness that really undercuts the whole argument that you must be right. It would be very easy. The things I say, I'm very happy to defend when I, when mm-hmm. people are not happy to defend what they say, it makes me question what they're saying. Thank you for writing in Vincent and for everyone else writing in about this as well. Derek Mozzarella wrote in. Said, hey, sacred crew. Any passing thoughts on the fact that former Bungie composer Marty O'Donnell is running for Congress? Has there ever been anyone else notable from the video game industry that actually went on to either be a politician or work for the government in a major way? Seems like a bit of an odd career switch, but who am I to tell one of the primary composers of the Halo soundtrack he's wrong about something? Thanks for the great content every week. I was curious what you thought about this, Chris. He's running in Nevada, I think. As a Republican for a House seat, is that right? I think so. Yeah, from from what I from what I gather, that's that's the case. Uh, it's weird. I mean, we we've I've been very long aware of Marty O'Donnell and and his political persuasion, just because I follow I follow um I follow Bungie pretty pretty intensely. I've uh you know, and, and I just it's it's interesting. I I, I read his his uh statement or whatever and it it does kind of i i don't really i think he's got a great benefit from just having a lot of inherent fandom that that could probably help him in a way that probably won't help other people running for that seat i guess but uh it's just kind of a lot of platitudes and he's like family values and stuff it's like okay what does that mean though like i i don't know whatever i don't i it's hard to really have a problem with it because he doesn't really say anything but you know, it's interesting for sure to see like an ex composer, especially like an influential one, run for Congress. That's I'm really curious how it's gonna how it's gonna shake up and what it even leads to and and how how that would how that would manifest itself as far as like any real policy manifesting. Like I, I'm deeply curious about this. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it other than that. It's pretty early, you know. Yeah, I, I do wonder if he'll find his way in be very interesting but yeah i saw that and i saw that there's this kind of territorialness i mean not a surprise where a person comes out as right wing in the video game industry and it's like why do left-wing people think that they have an owner ownership over this or any other creative field it's a little strange 
as if like no one it's like it's preposterous to think that someone can be right wing and make this stuff it's like that's such a closed minded silly point of view that ignores basically all of artistic history by the way <laughs> just, yeah just ignoring just ignoring like all of the art until the 20th century uh yeah anyway god yeah it, it was funny how i noticed so, not a lot but there's always some moron on twitter that's like yeah well it really shows that michael Salvatore really was the the better half of the the halo audio team or whatever like trying to just diminish anything that he's done because you they don't align with his political beliefs i was like all it's right but it's come on man but i just you know you gotta come to expect shit like that now but it was funny regardless yeah i mean look marty's no question no question about it a, a musical I, I would consider him at the very least for a period of time i, I don't know how long genius lasts as far as like arts go. i do think people people's artistic ability fades at a certain point like i i don't know if you could like musicians um you even see it with a lot of bands and, and a lot of artists where like you know th their last album is probably not going to be their best statistically speaking and it's probably not going to be the most interesting or, or the most fresh and and i can say that for sure based on hearing some of marty's work post destiny where it's like it's it's definitely not as it's definitely not as amazing, but it doesn't diminish the genius of those, you know, 14 years that he made like fucking banger after banger, amazing soundtrack after amazing soundtrack, back to back to back to back, hit after hit where, I mean, that's unquestionable talent. And I'm, I'm very curious how I, I'm curious beyond belief how he's going to fare in like a political space um, based on where he's uh, how he's running and what party he's running for. I don't imagine that I'm going to agree with really much of anything that he proposes, but I'm really curious to hear what those are, what those are uh, and how I, I'm just so fascinated by this whole thing. Really? Cause has, cause has this happened before? The question I can't think of but, anyone. No. Yeah. I, I don't, it might be the biggest example. Politics doesn't ever. take video games seriously. That's why I know that there's like no one I'm not thinking of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Like this is a, a, that's that's certainly a turn because there's people independently wealthy. I mean, this has been the case since the 80s, really. But there are enough people independently wealthy enough that have come from games that can easily just self-fund a campaign. It's a matter of if they can break through or not. Nevada is an interesting place. I mean, it's a red state. So, hmm. I mean, he, he could have a very good chance there. Crapton Picard wrote in. Said, fellas, I need advice on how to restore my dignity. In the run up to Unicorn Overlord, I am playing 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. My four year old was watching for a little bit. Later that night, we had guests over for dinner and he blurts out, Daddy is playing a game with girls in their underwear. I don't think I've ever been more embarrassed. I tried to explain that they were high school girls wearing their track team clothes, but that only made things worse. I'm not actually a weeb, but I keep letting these weebs talk me into their shit. Now it's ruining my life. What do I do? Go into hiding? I can never see these friends again. That's for sure. Thanks, guys. Please tell all the weebs to stand down. That's rough. Why is your son a narc? Yeah. Yeah. What'd you do? Your son just narcs on you like that? Four years old? He should know better than that. <laughs> you don't need to be him. telling anyone what daddy's playing on the television. You know, mind your own, <laughs> mind your own business. That's how I would have responded when he said that. It's like, daddy was playing games with girls in their underwear. And I would have been like, mind your fucking business. How could you, how could you and tell me? How could you tell on me? You know me. I I thought I did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you got to just own it. I mean, yeah. if you yeah. go in, just here's the thing. You're playing 13 Sentinels. That's not like, oh, I'm dabbling in some some weeb stuff. You, you're in it, dude. Yeah, Embrace who you are. Maybe. Quit hiding. Yeah, like you said, in the run up to Unicorn Overlord. So you're you interested in the game Unicorn Overlord, which is just as weeby and weird as any of vanilla wears games. You are in a little bit of denial, I think, unfortunately. We did not. Saving yourself by saying that you're playing as high school girls wearing their track team clothes. Is, now, I understand what you mean, but <laughs> that's a bad that's a bad catch. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bad default for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least bake in the myth like the anime mystery. How old is she? She's a thousand years old. She's immortal. Oh, that's interesting. You know, you got to do that kind of thing. You know, good Lord. What was the game I was making fun of that did that recently? That was like cracking me up. Oh, it was uh, Grand Blue Fantasy. There are like oh. two girls that are like 14 years old. And then you go look at their thing. And it's like she's like 8,700 years old or something like that. I'm like you <laughs> motherfuckers. I know what you're doing. You Ridiculous. Know? 
All right. That's it. That was a short episode. There's really not much to talk about, though, uh, this week. Yeah. There's just, um, can't, I can't force the news. Maybe there'll be more news. I mean, with this Gamergate 2.0 stuff, who knows? We'll maybe be covering yeah. this again. I do feel like the one thing I regret about Gamergate 1.0 is that it's not my own neutrality because I was kind of just like, ugh. You know, like, I don't, I don't really want to deal with this. And it was like late in my time at IGN, but that I thought that maybe ignoring it completely would be the best case scenario. But really, like, you got to take the news as it comes. And I think if people dealt with the topics at hand more honestly back in the day, a lot of the bullshit would have sifted out whatever whatever salient points are there, which I think there are probably some overarching salient points could have been better analyzed and discussed. And maybe we would never have been here, but it's like kind of like sweeping the dirt under the rug or something. And like I said, it's just, it's a, the, the media is basically irrelevant. Now the media was far from irrelevant when Gamergate happened and the media is completely irrelevant now. So it'll be up to really YouTubers, streamers, podcasters, and so on and so forth to kind of, navigate this this realm that was really left to the mainstream media back in the day and i think they did, did a, regardless of how silly 80 percent of it was and i think it was mostly yeah. silly not all of it um i do think the press did themselves a real disservice and there are the reasons why it, it happened why it stuck around why it became so big again that lee alexander piece is just like comical comical i remember reading that at my desk at ign and being like oh man you know like <laughs> you're so dumb and it's so wrong i mean that's how crazy it is too is like it was so wrong like gamers aren't your audience gamers are dead or whatever it's like what the fuck wow it's like the, it's, an it's like the anti-prescient you know yeah it's it's an eye-catching headline though yeah definitely so it got it got your i hope it was worth it <laughs> good lord i haven't heard i don't know what the hell she i think she's kind of just disappeared who knows yeah. um all right it's time to go. Let's go around the horn and say goodbye. Chris, goodbye to you, my friend. Goodbye. I, I, I man, if it, hopefully it doesn't rain because I have to go, I have to go grocery shopping and I walk. Yeah. So I don't want to deal with I used that. to love walking to the grocery store. That was always nice to do. Yeah. If I tried to walk to the grocery store where I lived in Santa Monica now, I'd probably be quickly immobilized by yeah. any number of obstacles. <laughs> illegal immigrants homeless people criminals post the post-apocalyptic scene probably was right. lucky to survive as long as i did doing it anyway but uh be safe out there we'll see you next week dustin goodbye to you goodbye i am going to retreat to play rebirth and i got one final thought about the game and is i think we need to put chadley in the dirt i think we need to put him to sleep permanently kill this Whoa. guy i've had Whoa. enough of him he's always calling me trying to ask me to go to another tower, tell me about a simulation. Fuck this guy. Oh, I've had enough of him. The simulation him. guy. I hate him. Yeah, he in the first one, he's the uh, the kid that like you research materia for or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He's a but, smug hey, you know, little asshole. You know, it's funny. That's like that was meeting him was the thing that put me off that game for a while. <laughs> like I met him. I, I was like, run, scan, use the scan animal materia or whatever the fuck right, it was called. Yeah, and, assess. I remember, and I remember assess, like, yeah. assess. And I was like, <sighs> and then I put it down for months. <laughs> I just did not want to do busy work for this fucking child. Yeah. Between him and the new Moogle, I'm just not feeling it. Yeah. Euthanize them both. Honestly. Mm, fair enough. All right. Well, time to go, my friends, on that note. See you next time for more Sacred Symbols. Appreciate your guys' love, kindness, and support over on Patreon, patreon.com slash media for early ad-free access and all the other perks. Couldn't do without you. Lastdaymedia.store for merch. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. See ya. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.